No MPRs. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Acting President. I ask the General Business Notice of Motion Number 530, standing in my name and that of Senator Lees and Senator Brown for today, to censure the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Affairs, Senator Heron, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is an objection, Senator Faulkner. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Acting President. Pursuant to contingent notice, then, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion relating to the conduct of business of the Senate, namely a motion to give precedence to general business notice of motion number 530. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Faulkner. Thank you. Uh, Madam Acting President, I move that General Business Notice of Motion Number 530 may be moved immediately and have precedence over all other business this day until determined. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting President. I move General Business Notice of Motion Number 530. And let me say, Madam Acting President, at the outset of this debate that the opposition has been extremely sparing in its uh, resort to censure motions. We've been very careful not to devalue uh, their importance by abusing them. In fact, we've moved only one motion of censure since losing office in March 1996. And it is quite significant that that censure motion was also directed at Senator Heron for his insensitivity in appointing a special auditor of ATSIC without proper prior consultation and for jeopardising funding for community development employment projects. That censure motion was successful. So I think it can be said in relation to uh, censure by the Senate, Senator Heron already has form. And there's no difficulty in opening the case against Senator Heron. The difficulty, of course, will be bringing the case to an end. Senator Heron is not just a failure as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. He's not just an embarrassment to the government. His words and actions over the past week have taken him to a higher level of disgrace. He now shares with the Prime Minister the, respons the responsibility for killing off any chance of reconciliation while the Howard government is in office. He has effectively shamed the Australian nation, and the government's stance on the stolen generation has, uh, in the words of the, uh, the government's own uh, hand-picked uh, Aboriginal and Social Justice Commissioner, Bill Jonas, brought reconciliation to a dead end. Now, Madam Acting President, the issues and challenges we face in rectifying the wrongs of the past and allowing our nation to come to terms with its history require leadership and they require focus from the government. And of course, this has been sadly lacking. Even with the limited portfolio and ministerial responsibilities that have been left with uh, Senator Heron, he's been an abject failure. And sadly, it's Senator Heron's failures have become failures of our nation. And we as a nation suffer because the issues that he is dealing with as minister are critical to all of us. The importance, Madam Acting President, of the reconciliation process can't be overstated. Most Australians understand what the government fails to comprehend. Most Australians understand because they have a heart. They want to deal honestly with Australia's history. And it is a fact that generations of Aboriginal children were forcibly removed from their families and placed in care for the sole purpose of assimilation. And credible researchers have estimated that between 45,000 and 55,000 children were removed from their families. And it is a fact that these practices were going on for many years right up to the 1970s. It is a fact 
that it was government policy to Europeanise the indigenous people of this nation. It is a fact that these policies have had a disastrous effect on the lives and culture of many Aborigines, their families and communities. And it is a painful chapter of uh, our history, and it's one that we must come to terms with. But Senator Heron and Mr Howard both have, to have the hide to deny the existence of the stolen generation. Senator Heron's submission to the Senate inquiry into the government's response to the Bringing Them Home report attacks the term, and, the, the term stolen generation and it attacks it relentlessly. According to his submission, stolen generation is, quote, a simplistic concept, page two, simplistic terminology, page four, so called, page four, a falsely constructed past, page five, a rhetorical phrase, page 18 amongst many other attempts at semantic denial. All through the submission, Senator Heron tries to get away with the logic that because, as he alleges, the numbers aren't either certain or large enough, then it can't be called a generation. And what a small-minded, pedantic, insensitive and insulting argument it is. What an insult to those people who, who suffered and continued to suffer as a consequence of the policies of forced assimilation. Now, since uh, then, of course, uh, Senator Heron has tried to, uh, to weasel his way out of this uh, David Irving-like uh, rewriting of history. He's had the gall to say, let me quote him, the Heriot Report does not employ the term stolen generation. And that, I quote him again, stolen generation does not appear in the Heriot Report. Indeed, Senator Heron's own submission Baldly states that, quote, although not used in the Bringing Them Home report, the term stolen is now inter used interchangeably with the term forcibly removed as used in the Heriock inquiry. Senator Heron also says, Madam Acting President, that the term stolen generation has been brought up after the report, after the report by the media and, 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 and others. Well, you're wrong about that, Senator Heron. You're just plain wrong about that. It was used in the report. You trivialise this important debate by trying to score such pathetic points. In fact, the term stolen generation appears 19 times, 19 times in the Heriot report, and that is a fact. Senator Heron tried to weasel his way out of of that one uh, earlier, as you know, by saying on Thursday last, in answer to a question I asked, that, quote, the word stolen generation appear many times in the report in relation to organisations that were formed, uh, formed called the stolen generation, whatever the organisation may be. That's Senator Heron's words. Again, he's wrong. Anyone who cares to read the report will find that he is plain wrong on that point. There are at least seven references to the stolen generation in the Bringing Them Home report that are not linked to any organisations. On this matter, Senator Heron, again you are wrong and again you have misled the Senate and the Australian public. And of course, you know, Senator Heron's got so much egg on his face uh, nowadays, it's, uh, it's um, it's, hard, you know, it's pretty hard to distinguish uh, the bloke from the yoke in this case, but, Senator Heron, again you have misled. And I just can't fathom the motives in producing this submission. Why did the minister and the government do it? Several times in question time, the minister said to us, uh, and throughout uh, the last few days of media interviews, there's no reason produced no reason at all to explain why, in one fell swoop, the government has insulted the stolen generations and comprehensively undermined the reconciliation process in this country. And the submission canvasses past practices of assimilation as, quote, benign in intent, but at the same time points the finger squarely at state governments and churches, all of whom have taken the Bringing Them Home report on board, all of whom have apologised to Aborigines for these allegedly benign past practices. But Senator Heron's submission is not benign. It's poisonous. It poisons the goodwill needed 
to make process in this country on reconciliation. And the Labor Party has made no bones about the, our view that reconciliation is a threshold issue for our nation. As, as Tim Colbatch wrote in The Age last uh, Thursday, he said achieving reconciliation between white and black Australia is one of the few first order issues in Australian politics. It matters because Australia's self-respect and international standing depends on it righting the wrongs of the past. And it matters because until there's reconciliation, we cannot leave that past behind us and move into the better future that white and black Australians want. Well, I agree wholeheartedly with that. It is a first order issue. It requires leadership and it requires focus from Senator Heron and the government government, and they give it neither. If any issue or any policy required mutual obligation, this one does. There's no question that the Aboriginal community and their leaders have shown sincerity and goodwill and, and I think, patience with the reconciliation process. Yet this is always thrown back in their faces by Senator Heron and Mr Howard. It's been thrown back in their faces with the disgraceful government submission to the Senate. And the submission really shows Senator Heron's true colours on this issue. The government's embarked on a deliberate strategy, and the government and Senator Heron in particular use Aboriginal issues as a way to divide us rather than bringing us together as a nation. And it's inconceivable that Senator Heron and the Prime Minister's office, who were involved in the drafting process for the submission, could have been unaware of the impact of the submission that it, the, the impact it would have on the, on the Aboriginal community in this country and the reconciliation process. They were guilty of playing the basis form of wedge politics, and they are deserving of censure in this Senate. And the wedge politics theory is, of course, uh, super, supported, I think, by Mr Howard's uh, record on Aboriginal affairs, his record on reconciliation and state state rights and race issues. He ha John Howard, of course, has been prepared to override states' rights on anything from the importation of Canadian salmon to euthanasia, but he'll not lift a finger to stop black children being put in jail for trivial offences. And that's the same John Howard who consistently opposed sanctions against the racist South African regime, and the same John Howard who used to, to brush away concerns about, um, about the people of East Timor as an obsession of the political left. But, of course, the, John Howard's piece de resistance was his advocacy of race as a, a criterion of Australia's immigration policy. Who can forget uh, that uh, over, you know, the issue, over that issue? You had the wets in the, in the Liberal Party uh, choosing to split ranks. Uh, in the 1980s, I suppose, the wets were actually small L Liberals. Now they're, now they're just really wimps, nothing more than a crumbling edge of a Conservative government in this country. But you've got a Prime Minister with a shameful record on these issues, and the role played by the Prime Minister's Department in drafting Senator Heron's submission should, I think, come as no surprise to anybody in this chamber. Written by overzealous officials, the submission faithfully encapsulates the insensitive and pedantic views of the Prime Minister and, of course, his trusty lieutenant, Senator Heron, who happily so signed off on a poisonous submission which, should have been, which he should have ordered to have been shredded from the very start and said, have another go, have another go, start again. But of course, Madam Acting President, Senator Heron so often likes to remind us he's visited 80 Aboriginal communities in his first two years as minister. Well, that's, that's good going, 80 remote uh, uh, rural Aboriginal communities. He says he sat down the dirt and chewed the fat with those communities. Well, I tell you now, he couldn't have listened when he went there. If he did, it was in one ear and out the other. Otherwise, he would have known better than to put his name to that submission. He would have been aware of the pain and the hurt that that submission caused. And of course, John Howard's the engineer of, who's designed the collapse of the reconciliation process, but Senator Heron has been his willing accomplice in the Senate as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. And I suppose he'll probably say, oh, he's just following orders of uh, Mr Howard. But that will not excuse Senator Heron's shameful approach on this uh, issue, particularly his, uh, his shameful approach to the stolen generation 
and the, and the broader question of reconciliation to which it's inextricably linked. Now, Madam Acting President, Senator Heron's shortcomings as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs have, of course, been recognised by the Prime Minister. He relieved Senator Heron of the responsibility of native title. That was passed on to the Prime Minister's uh, soulmate, uh, Senator Minchin. Subsequently, Senator Heron was relieved of responsibility for um, um, uh, reconciliation. That was passed on to Mr Ruddock. Even though, uh, um, he, even though he's managed to torpedo the reconciliation problem with his own submission. Aboriginal education, of course, is a shared responsibility with the Minister for Education. Housing, Aboriginal housing, a shared responsibility with Senator Newman, and so it goes on. And, you know, even though Senator, um, uh, Senator Heron might be a, a, an eminent doctor, the Prime Minister won't give him responsibility for Aboriginal health. That's the responsibility for the Minister for Health. You actually wonder what the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs in this government actually does. At the very least, you would expect him to provide leadership on Indigenous affairs. You'd expect him to provide impetus and drive to Indigenous programs. But no, there's no leadership from Senator Heron. There's just a vacuum. And what, what about Senator Heron on the issue of mandatory sentencing? Invisible. Where is he on the issue of an apology? Says nothing. But he's, to the extent that he does have anything to say, it's on the other side of the argument. Even when he's given the opportunity to show some leadership in repudiating the appalling comments of the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory about Aboriginal interpreter services. He squibs that as well. And as for driving Indigenous programs, forget it. What a sorry record he's been responsible for. In December 1997, the Commonwealth committed $63 million to deal with the recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report. Senator Heron's submission to the Senate inquiry states that this $63 million, quote, reflected the overriding priority identified in the Herriot report itself for facilitating family reunion and addressing the enduring effects on the people concerned. Well, let's have a look at what the government's done. Actually, have a look what Senator Heron's delivered in this particular area. Because a paper that was tabled in this chamber on Monday, titled Progress on Commonwealth Initiatives in Response to the Bringing Them Home report, gives an insight into how utterly hopeless Senator Heron has been in the discharge of his responsibilities as minister. The paper shows that a paltry proportion of the $63 million has been spent. I'll give, give just four examples. Four, four examples of how miserly the government's been. Of $11.25 million committed to family reunions, only $3.738 million has been spent. Of the $17 million committed to training and support for counselling services, a pathetic $0.865 million has been spent, less than 7 per cent of the total. Of the $16 million committed to providing the all-important counselling services, a miserly $1.712 million, or 10 per cent, has been spent. And of the $5.9 million committed to enhance Indigenous family support and parenting programs, only $188,000 has been spent, and that's less than 3 per cent. So it's not surprising that you've got individuals who've been denied of, uh, of, of parental and family love and support, uh, they've been denied education in their first language, separated from their own culture, that they would suffer social and, uh, and psychological problems uh, in later life. And that's where that $63 million uh, should have been directed. They needed that as a matter of urgency. They're not getting it. And it is the minister, Senator Heron, who's got to accept absolute responsibility for that. And despite, Madam Acting President, such a pathetic record, Senator Heron seems to take to this task with relish. So much so that he's decided to enlighten us in question time with quotes from that dour and pessimistic uh, uh, 19th century philosopher, uh, Schopenhauer. I mean, Senator Heron pious, piously quoted from Schopenhauer, didn't you, about truth passing through three stages, ultimate, ultimately being accepted as self-evident. Uh, it's the second time I note, Madam Acting President, that Schopenhauer has actually made it into the Senate Hansard in the last 12 months. Because as recently as the 11th of August last year, Senator Les Len Harris used the exact same quote of Senator Heron in his maiden speech. That's where you found it, wasn't it, Senator Heron? In Senator Heron's own maiden speech. 
The One Nation senator used the same Address quote the to describe his personal journey and other aspects of his life. And of course, I think Senator Heron must have been quite surprised. Quite surprised. I, look, look. There's no doubt, uh, Senator Heron. I think, I think you'd have had the One Nation senator, Senator Harris. Really, really, you could have knocked him down with a feather. I'm sure. When, when we found that you, as Minister for Aboriginal Address Affairs chair, in this please, government, Faulkner. were drawing on the same order, well order, point of order. order, order. Point of Senator order. Faulkner, Sit order. Down. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting uh, President. Uh, if Senator Faulkner wants to engage in a most offensive diatribe, could I at least invite you to uh, direct him to make his comments less personal by directing them through the chair? I would ask Senator Faulkner to address the chair, please. Madam Acting President, Schopenhauer might well have had uh, uh, Senator Heron's interpretation of the Bringing Them Home report uh, in mind when he wrote uh, memorably another Schopenhauer quote, Senator Heron, one for you. Quote, address books are like a mirror. If an ass looks in, you can't expect an angel to look out. You are, Senator Heron, not fit to serve as a minister order. in this government. Point of order. order. You are order. Point, order. Of order. Order. point of order. Order. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, you've got the humiliating situation where the Leader of the Opposition is reading from a prepared uh, speech and therefore is not able to direct his uh, uh, comments uh, via the requirements of the standing orders. And so I understand it is difficult for Senator Faulkner to comply because he's got to think on his feet. But I would invite you, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, Madam, Madam Acting President, to uh, remind Senator Faulkner on each and every occasion to direct his comments through the chair. I would remind Senator Faulkner. That's absolutely true, Madam, uh, Madam uh, Acting President. I am reading those quotes. Uh, they're prepared in front of me, and I think they're very worthwhile ones. And I commend them to the Senate. I think there will be a lot of interest in them. A lot of oh, Senator, F Senator Heron, I would ask Senator Faulkner to address the chair. It is quite appropriate for him to read from notes to quotes. Of course it is. Madam, Madam, Madam Acting President, Senator Heron is, does not, is not fit to serve as a minister in any government. He is not fit to serve as a minister in any government. He stands condemned for his incompetence as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. He stands condemned for his lack of in, in, insincerity as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. And he stands condemned for his failure of leadership as Minister for Aboriginal Order. Time has expired. Affairs. Senator Faulkner. He deserves to Order, be Senator Faulkner. Your time has expired. Order. Minister. Madam President. Uh, the motion is uh, that the Senate censures the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs for his failure to fulfil his ministerial responsibilities and provide leadership in Indigenous affairs. Madam President, I, I know the motion is going to be passed uh, because the Democrats have indicated their position, as in the Labor Party uh, has uh, moved it and Senator, uh, and Senator Brown is supporting, uh, as well as uh, Senator Lees. Madam President, so it's a bit pointless uh, listening to the diatribes which will be proposed. But it, paradoxically, it gives me the opportunity to respond to the motion, and uh, I'm happy to do so, because I reject absolutely the terms of the motion. I, I actually can point to very significant achievements in this portfolio over the last four years, and I was very gratified when the Prime Minister asked me to take on this most challenging portfolio. There's no doubt that it's a difficult one, but I've found the experience very rewarding. I have provided decisive and effective leadership that has set a new direction in Indigenous affairs, a direction that is taking Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people away from crippling dependence on welfare to economic self-sufficiency and self-empowerment, and I have been doing this consistently. In my first speech as Minister, I set out the policy direction in my Lions Forum speech, and I said on that equation, quote, our aim is to promote and encourage Indigenous progress away from handouts and welfare towards genuine self-empowerment. It is about looking at what can be achieved. It is about setting realistic goals and working towards them. It is about better understanding Indigenous Australians, and it is about involving Indigenous Australians more fully in planning and developing their future." End of quote. And I do not believe in creating policy in a vacuum. I have been to hundreds of Indigenous communities all over in Australia, and in those communities I have listened to what it is that Indigenous people want for themselves and their children. 
And what they want is this government, and what they want, this government is delivering. They want decent housing, good education, meaningful work, adequate health facilities, and they want a measure of control over their lives. They do not want handouts, and they do not want to be dependent on welfare. Madam President, two years ago, oh, sorry, Mr Acting Deputy President, in 1998 I issued the discussion paper removing the welfare shackles. This paper looked at ways Indigenous business and investment programs could be used to generate further investment and greater wealth distribution to Indigenous communities. I'm also looking at how Indigenous people can have more influence over their day-to-day -day lives. I want to see substantial devolution of decision-making power away from central offices and out to the regions, and this is happening, Mr Acting Deputy President. And this in no way diminishes the role of ATSIC, but makes it an even more effective advocate for Indigenous people. I'm pleased to confirm that I have a positive working relationship with the new uh, first elected chair of ATSIC, and I look forward to a continuing productive partnership. Last year, Mr Acting Deputy President, I released jointly with ATSIC a discussion paper on regional autonomy, which foreshadowed a process of consultation and the development of models relevant to regional and local needs. This approach is endorsed by the ATSIC board, and currently a restructure is underway which will provide much more influence at the local level. This will result in more responsive and effective program delivery. This approach will be supported by the work of the Commonwealth Grants, which the work of the Commonwealth Grants Commission is undertaking on a relative needs basis in Indigenous communities. And it's consistent with my determination that resources go to areas of greatest need where they will make the most significant and sustained differences. In terms of making a real difference in Indigenous people's lives, I've worked closely with ministerial colleagues who have responsibility, responsibility for Indigenous-specific programs. The Commonwealth Government since 1996 has demonstrated a steadfast and practical commitment to improving the lives and prospects of Indigenous Australians. We are fully aware that Australians of Indigenous background as a whole represent the most disadvantaged group in our society, and we've been addressing the elements of that disadvantage. The government's approach has been to tackle the fundamentals of disadvantage, the key priorities of health, education, employment and housing, and to encourage the active participation of Indigenous Australians in partnership with us in building a better future for themselves. Not only do Indigenous Australians have access to all mainstream Commonwealth government programs and services, as is their right, but we have in addition committed the highest amount of funding on record, amounting in the current financial year to $2.2 billion to targeted Indigenous specific programs. And it's important to understand that such programs, which are aimed at the root cause of disadvantage, cannot be expected to produce instant improvements. The government's critics fail to recognise the complexity of the circumstances and needs of Indigenous Australians who, like all Australians, want a decent quality of life, life reasonable access to government services, a fair go, and support to build a better future for themselves and their children as fully participating members of our society. Madam President, sorry, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Labor Party had 13 years. 13 years of lost opportunity yeah, yeah. to make an impact, well, they but they fundamentally failed to make any significant improvements. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm saddened that the Democrats are supporting them in this motion because they, uh, they obviously know more than the Labor Party in this. They know more than the Labor Party. And the Democrats were around when the Labor Party was in power, and they did nothing. They did nothing to support what I'm, proposed, what I'm proposing now. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm pleased to be able to report that in those fundamental areas, areas which really make a difference to people, progress is being made. For example, in employment. Despite the historically high unemployment rate for Indigenous people, there have been signs of improvement in recent years. For example, the proportion of Indigenous Australians employed in professional occupations has increased from 14% in 1986 to 22% in 1996. The number of Indigenous students in vocational education and training has increased from 15,000 in 1990 to 45,000 in 1998, and the number enrolled in higher education tripled between 1988 and 1998. The government is pursuing three broad strategies to, employ, to improve employment prospects and outcomes for Indigenous people. Increasing the job skills and employment opportunities of Indigenous Australians through a special Indigenous employment policy announced in the last budget promoting employment and business opportunities in remote areas, for example tourism and mining, and encouraging the unemployed to undertake community work in return for income support through community development employment projects and facilitating their move to mainstream employment. The new Indigenous employment policy, worth about $115 million per year, incorporates three major elements. Firstly, a new Indigenous employment program of $50 million per year that includes flexible wage assistance for employers who provide full-time employment to disadvantaged Indigenous jobs, job seekers and support for new apprenticeships and cadetships. 
Secondly, an Indigenous Small Business Fund with funding of $11 million over three years to undertake programs in skills development, mentoring, networking and advisory services. And thirdly, additional measures and funding to improve Indigenous job seekers' access to job network services. In relation to housing, Mr Acting Deputy President, there is evidence that notwithstanding a 140 per cent increase in the recorded Aboriginal population since the 1976 census, there have been improvements in housing conditions. In the early 1970s, up to 20 per cent of Indigenous families lived in improvised dwellings. That number is now less than 3 per cent. The 12,000 new housing units provided over the last decade is equivalent to 13 per cent of total Indigenous dwellings. This is a significant outcome. The proportion of Indigenous families who own or are purchasing their own homes has increased from 24 per cent in 1976 to 33 per cent today. Indigenous housing now accounts for 20 per cent of total Commonwealth spending on public and community housing. The Com Community Housing Infrastructure Program is the government's largest Indigenous-specific housing program. <coughs> HATSIC manages this program with funding for 1999-2000 reaching $261 million. In 1997-98, over 600 housing units were purchased or constructed, over 1,100 were renovated, and a number of infrastructure projects, including sewerage, water power and roads, were funded. CHIP includes the very successful Army ATSIC Health Community Assistance Constructive Construction Initiative introduced by this government in 1996-97, with funding of $40 million over four years. So far, seven projects spanning West Australia, Northern Territory, South Australia and Queensland have been completed and the Army has effectively provided new housing, upgrades of water services and reticulation systems, waste management sewerage system and sewerage systems and transport infrastructure upgrades, upgrades to some of our most needy communities in rural and remote Australia. Another Commonwealth pro major Commonwealth program is the Aboriginal Rental Housing Program, which is a tied component of the Commonwealth State Housing Agreements. This program has funding of $91 million annually, and in 1997-98 an estimated 500 houses were acquired with these funds. Around 60 per cent of, this pro of the ARHP funded housing is managed by community organisations. In addition, the Commonwealth provides concessional home loan support through ATSIC, about $40 million per year, up to 400 loans, loans are provided annually, and short-term accommodation for homeless Indigenous people through the Supported Accommodation Assistance Program and through Aboriginal Hostels Limited. The Torres Strait Regional Authority also has housing and infrastructure programs, totalling about $12 million in 1998-99. I turn now to education. There is evidence of significant improvements in education for Indigenous Australians over the past decade. The proportion of Indigenous students who stay on at school through to final year is almost quadrupled in the last 20 years, from 8.6 per cent in 1976 to over 32 per cent in 1998. The proportion of Indigenous people with post-secondary school qualifications has increased from 6 per cent in 1976 to 13.6 per cent in 1996. The number of Indigenous higher education students has gone from around 100 in the 1970s to over 8,000 today. The importance the government places on ensuring Indigenous children get as good a, an education as possible can be seen in the government's National Indigenous English Literacy and Numeracy Strategy, which was launched by the Prime Minister on the 29th of March this year. It will do this through working with parents and communities, enhancing performance and outcomes monitoring, addressing poor hearing and other health issues, lifting school attendance rates, training teachers and using flexible teaching methods. The strategy is an example of practical reconciliation amongst all Australians. The strategy is supported by a number of prominent Indigenous identities, including Evelyn Scott, singer Jimmy Little and footballers Nicky Winmar, Byron Pickett, Cliff Lyons and Nathan Blacklock. The strategy is consistent with Australia's top-level education policy agreement, the 1999 National Goals for Schooling in Australia in the 21st century. This agreement has committed all Ministers of Education to the achievement of educational equality for Indigenous Australians as an urgent national priority. The commitment of federal, state and territory governments to addressing disadvantage in Indigenous education is also supported by the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Education Policy. The goals of the policy are the improvement of Indigenous people in decision-making, equality of access to education, equity in participation and equitable and appropriate education outcomes. These goals are enshrined in legislation and supported by a range of programs, including a special Aboriginal study grant scheme to assist individual students and special admission policies in tertiary institution. institutions. The government has increased spending for improved educational outcomes for Indigenous students by around $16.3 million in 1999-2000. All states and territories have agreed to indemnify, to identify performance improvement targets for reporting in 2004. This will facilitate the development of national reports in areas such as attendance, literacy, retention rates and Indigenous employment. I turn to health. 
Although Aboriginal health standards remain unsatisfactory, they've been improving. Indigenous infant mortality rates have been reduced since the 1970 from 20 times the non-Indigenous rate to three to five times that rate. It's not, not perfect, but we're getting there. The prevalence of trachoma has been substantially reduced overall. Death rates from infectious and parasitic disease are declining, and male death rates from cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, injury and homicide have been declining since the mid-1980s. The government has made Indigenous health a priority focus since coming to office. The expenditure has increased 51 per cent in real terms since March 1996, and by 2002-2003 it will have increased by 62 per cent over that period. There are four broad components to the government's strategy, developing primary health care and infrastructure and resources, targeting risk factors and specific causes of disability, morbidity and mortality, improving the evidence base for health interventions, and improving communication with primary health care services, Indigenous peoples and the general population. Key initiatives in the, in the Commonwealth's practical efforts to improve Indigenous health include the Government has agreed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Framework Agreements to improve planning and provision of health services with ATSIC, the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Sector, and the Governments in each State and Territory. In 1997, Ministers for Health agreed on a set of national performance indicators and targets for Indigenous health, and now every Government reports on progress made in Aboriginal health and provides data enabling national monitoring to occur. Under the auspices of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Framework Agreements, state and federal governments are also addressing the socio-economic issues underlying the poor health status of Indigenous people. For example, through a new national framework that provides guidelines for the design, construction and maintenance of safe, healthy and sustainable housing. I turn now to the apology and reconciliation, which uh, Senator Faulkner spoke about. Both the Prime Minister and I, as Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, have expressed our personal sorrow over the distress that past practices of family separation have caused to Indigenous people. The Government, in August last year, sponsored an historic motion of reconciliation in both Houses of Parli Parliament, which expressed deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians suffered injustices due to, due to the practices of past generations, which recognised that many Indigenous people continue to suffer trauma and hurt as a result of those practices and which reaffirmed a wholehearted commitment to the cause of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous non Australians. Regarding the separated children inquiry, I have come in for concerted criticism in the last week because of my submission to the Senate inquiry into stolen children. I can only repeat that I'm very sorry if people have been hurt and distressed by the reopening of those issues. It was, it was certainly not of my, uh, not of my doing uh, in that the, the Senate uh, Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee asked for a report and, and I addressed the terms of reference of that inquiry and the government had nothing to do with composing those. To sensibly and responsibly address the terms of reference requires an, an analysis of all aspects of the issue, including the question of the numbers. We developed our response to bringing them home in 1997 in line with Harry Ox's finding that family reunion was the most urgent need of separated people. We issued a major ded dedicated package of initiatives totaling $63 million to address the consequences of past Indigenous child separation practices, focusing on helping people to re-establish family links, supporting individuals and families through counselling and parenting programs, and providing an avenue for those affected to record their experiences. In relation to law and justice, I have always been very concerned about the disproportionate rate of incarceration of Indigenous people, and this concern resulted in my convening in 1997, at my volition, a summit of state and territory ministers responsible for justice, policing, correctional service and, indige and Indigenous affairs and Indigenous representatives. Initiatives arising out of the summit included the development of Indigenous justice strategies by state and territory to reduce this states and territories to reduce this over-representation. The Ministerial Council for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, which I'm chairing this year, is committed to progressing those, these initiatives in cooperation with Indigenous organisations. In the 1997-98 budget, $1.9 million was provided for pilot initiatives designed to improve long-term outcomes for young offenders, including half a million dollars specifically for Indigenous young offenders. An evaluation of Indigenous pilot projects found that the projects had a measurable impact on young offenders and at-risk young people. And in the 1999-2000 budget, the budget committed, the government committed a further $1 million over two years to fund similar young offenders' diversionary programs. I turn now to family violence, which is something that is so fundamental, Madam Minister Acting Deputy President, that it seems to be totally unrecognised. There is a state of denial in the Australian community about family violence, and particularly from the Labor Party. 
because anybody who has visited communities, as you, as you have, Mr Acting Deputy President, and I have certainly, it's been a great privilege to do so over the last four years, the level of family violence in this community is almost overwhelming, and yet the, the Democrats in particular have taken no cognizance of this. No, I, I, I understand the Labor Party taking no cognizance. You have the right of reply, ma Madam President. Serious levels of violence. Madam President, the, La the Democrats were there for the 13 years that the Labor Party was there. And when did they take the initiative on family violence? Serious levels of violence and abuse are becoming the norm in many Indigenous communities, and many women and children live in constant danger. I'm very concerned that we address this in an urgent and effective way. I therefore sought advice from Indigenous community representatives and, with their assistance, developed a national strategy on Indigenous family violence, which has since been endorsed by the Ministerial Council on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. I did that, Madam President. I did that, and I regard it with a badge of honour, not, not some political uh, motion that will occur today. Madam President, Order. we are trialling a coordinated whole-of-government approach in a number of communities around the country, and under my chairmanship, Matt Macatsia will be monitoring progress. I'm very pleased to have the support of Senator Newman in addressing this issue, in my view, the most pressing issue in Indigenous Australia. The most pressing issue, Mr Acting Deputy President, the most pressing issue in Indigenous Australia today is family violence. Family violence, no question, and I, I'll get emotional about it because I, when I see those, those, those 13 years of wasted opportunity, and this has been going on for many, many years, long, long before. Madam President, I, uh, Madam, Mr Acting Deputy, I want, to, I want that in, in, in Hansard that Senator Bolker says it's a lot of bunkum. I, I would, I would Thank you, Deputy President. Deputy President. What I've said was Senator that Bolkers, the minister are you rising claim, on a point of order? Are you rising on a point of order? order? And I rise on a point of order so that this minister doesn't distort the facts again. I said what he was asserting about 13 years was a lot of bunkum. He knows full well what I said. He is trying to weasel his way That's out of this. That's not a point of order. He is trying to you resume his your this, seat. But it should Senator go on. Senator Bolkers will resume your seat. The minister, Senator Heron. Yes. Mr. Yes. Acting Deputy President, yes. may I continue? Um, as I mentioned, uh, Senator Newman is addressing this issue, in my view, the most pressing issue in Indigenous Australia. And through the partnerships on domestic violence, an amount of $6 million being is being provided specifically for Indigenous projects through her portfolio. Mr Acting Deputy President, the opposition claims I failed to show leadership in Indigenous affairs and failed to fulfil my ministerial responsibilities. They were the, that's the motion, and, and the Democrats and uh, Senator Brown. Over the last four years, there have been demonstrable improvements in Indigenous outcomes, improvements that will continue because they are soundly based, because they reflect the aspirations of the majority of Indigenous people, and because they are adequately and appropriately resourced. Mr Dacney, Deputy President, those, those issues are based on what community people tell me as I go around communities. That's what they tell me. I have listened. I have listened to community people. I haven't listened to the rhetoric of the Labor Party. because. I can guarantee you, I would be very interested to know, Mr Acting Deputy President, how many communities have the Labor Party actually visited in Australia? I've been going for four years. I've been going to a few. He's been to a few. He's been to a few. Mr Balkus, Senator Balkus says he's been to a few. I've been to a few, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm happy to stand on my record, on my record and the record of the government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Leader of the Democrats, Senator Lees. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President isn't something that uh, we enjoy doing, and certainly it gives me no personal pleasure to co-sponsor this motion today. And uh, I note, as uh, Senator Heron uh, was speaking on a number of occasions, he attacked us specifically. And I will respond to that as I move through uh, the few notes that I have in front of me. But I have worked with Senator Heron on a number of occasions, particularly in the Community Affairs Committee on Health Issues, and I have found him to have a very thorough understanding of how the Australian health system works. Indeed, I respect his knowledge of that system. So on a, on a number of uh, points uh, I that I want to make, I uh, am even more disturbed at some of the answers that he's given to Senator Ridgway uh, over the last uh, week or so. But when we look at this portfolio, I simply cannot think of any other minister that is so constantly surrounded in controversy. There is no other minister in this government that, while uh, uh, everything that he, as he just described, is being done, and, and he believes he's working with the best intentions and towards, towards what Aboriginal people are actually looking for, he is constantly surrounded by controversy. Now, it, it is a difficult portfolio area that we often see uh, much heated debate rising from. When we go back to Mabo, 
I think most of us who were here in uh, 1993 will remember the debates that went through to Christmas. We remember the WIC debates. But here we have issue after issue, time after time, from the, from the beginning of this minister's responsibility for this portfolio, from his treatment of ATSIC onwards, constant controversy. And I don't think at any stretch of the imagination that he could say that the Aboriginal people of Australia believe anything like uh, that glossy report uh, that he just gave, going back in many cases 10 and, uh, and more years into the Aboriginal Affairs portfolio. It is very unusual for us to censure a minister in this place, and I remind Senator Heron again that it was indeed a he who was censured in this place the last time the Labor Party uh, moved to do so. I think uh, all of us read, uh, or certainly all of us on this side of the chamber and towards this end of the chamber, read with disbelief that executive summary uh, in the government's uh, submission to the inquiry into the stolen generation. And I quote those words. Uh, and these are his words, there was never a generation of stolen children. Now, obviously, uh, the minister has uh, said very clearly again today that he not just uh, approved of the submission, he in fact signed it off. So we can presume that uh, this was no accident. These are specifically chosen words, and I think the key words come back to generation and the word stolen. So all we can put it down to is a major lack of understanding uh, lack of understanding of the very people that he has stood up here again in this chamber today and said that he is actually representing. In fact, I think I would go uh, even further and say it is worse than that, because to have this statement leaping out at us from the executive summary demonstrates a complete lack of empathy and very, very poor judgment on the part of the minister. And perhaps. Uh, there is a grain of truth in uh, what some are saying, that this is indeed a calculated move by the government that uh, wants to set them apart from those in the community that are actually moving towards reconciliation for political purposes of their own. But given all, of, uh, all that has happened since uh, the first uh, white settlers arrived, since uh, uh, some 200 plus years ago, uh, the first uh, Europeans uh, set foot uh, permanently in this country. Surely we owe it to Indigenous Australians to listen and to actually take note of what their priorities are and what their real concerns are. And uh, surely we have a moral duty at least to support the process of reconciliation and to help all of us come to terms with our history. And in particular, looking at the motion before us today, Aboriginal Australians deserve a minister who will present their case clearly and vigorously and actually stand up and represent them and their priorities. And to suggest that uh, this is all just a political stunt of some sort, that we should take politics out of this issue, is again not listening to what Aboriginal people are saying about what they see this minister's role as being. I think uh, primarily the, the hope for reconciliation now, uh, if not uh, dead altogether, is certainly moving in the wrong direction. And uh, if uh, there is one person in this community that should be working actively for reconciliation, apart from uh, Mr Ruddock, who has primary responsibility for that, it's the Minister for Aboriginal, uh, Ab Aboriginal Affairs. And I just want to stress here that I don't believe Aboriginal people deserve a minister who effectively denies the existence of generation after generation of Aboriginal people who were systematically taken so stolen systematically, separated systematically from their families. Now, it isn't uncommon for people to simply switch off and try to ignore something that they're finding rather difficult. They're finding it uh, disturbing and they prefer it if it would all go away. But it's a bit too easy to take comfort in these uh, comments that we're hearing about how this all happened uh, in another era. It's all been done uh, generations ago by people who had no uh, involvement with any, with any of us. It was, also, it was somebody else. That this whole issue now uh, and the, the terms itself are pretty simplistic and uh, that the whole thing was really benign, that uh, people in those days didn't really understand what they were doing, didn't understand the ramifications. Well, on that point in particular, I want to pause for a moment in the brief few minutes that I have to just quote from a, uh, a report. In this was written in 1949. And it's from uh, uh, the report of uh, Patrol Officer Evans, dated the 23rd of December. And this is uh, after his patrol uh, took him to Wave Hill 
Timber Creek areas. And I'll just read one paragraph. The removal of the children from Wave Hill by McRoberts and Miller aircraft was accompanied by distressing scenes the like of which, which I wish never to experience again. The engines of the plane are not stopped at Wave Hill, and the noise, combined with the strangeness of an aircraft, only accentuated the grief and fear of the children, resulting in near hysteria in two of them. I am quite convinced that news of my action at Wave Hill preceded me to other stations, resulting in children being taken away prior to my arrival. So for anyone to suggest that uh, this was not done with full knowledge of the impact on the children and on their families. And for those interested, this report goes on to recommend things like uh, children under four shouldn't be taken, uh, mothers should be uh, permitted to accompany them so they can actually see the children are being looked after, etc. People understood the impact of this on Aboriginal people and Aboriginal families. Indeed, this is uh, within uh, Senator Heron's time. Uh, and in, indeed, uh, the time I think of all of us in this place, this isn't something that happened way back uh, before uh, before any of us uh, were here. So, if, is it any wonder that Aboriginal people and uh, those concerned uh, with reconciliation are outraged at this minister's comments and his uh, his lack of understanding of the impact of what has happened, Gener generation after generation, indeed, been still happening in the 1970s. He stands up here today and lists some of the government's spending in the area of Aboriginal affairs, for which we are very pleased. But it isn't balanced with the full picture of spending on all Australians, and it isn't balanced with a look at many of the outcomes, many of the indices that we should be using to see how successful we've been. And it isn't balanced with many of uh, this government's actions in areas such as ab study, which it's largely gutted. I want to now turn to the questions relating to health, which disturb me, um, considering Senator Heron's knowledge of the health portfolio. Senator Ridgway asked a very specific question of the minister on Commonwealth spending on primary health care. And this uh, isn't a question that's come from nowhere. If you look at statements uh, from the AMA, where they uh, talk about the fact, and I'll just quote here, while our health system delivers world-class health care in increasingly difficult circumstances, we should also consider the plight of Indigenous Australians. While the health of the broader community goes from strength to strength, the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders remains at third world standards. And it goes on to look at uh, the fact that we're so far behind nations such as New Zealand uh, and Canada and the United States, where they have been able to reverse the trend and actually improve health care outcomes for their communities and actually spend some real money on primary health care because, after all, this was specifically what Senator Ridgway's question uh, was about. And I quote the AMA again, at page three of uh, their World Health Day um, release. We are not spending what is needed on primary health care for Indigenous Australians. This is the Commonwealth's area of responsibility. And Senator Ridgway asked, and I quote, is it not the case that for every Medicare dollar spent on non-Indigenous Australians, only 27 cents is spent on Indigenous people? Now, what Senator Heron did is to refer, uh, firstly, to Dr Diebel and uh, to really uh, misconstrue uh, his report and his uh, comments about the le level of health spending, rolled everything in, state and commonwealth expenditure, ignoring the primary care issue, and read selectively from page 13 of his Bancroft oration. But if you read on in his own oration, it says, as you go down page 13, Indigenous Australians received very little from the, the two largest commonwealth programs, Medicare and the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. Per person, their benefits under Medicare are only 27 per cent of the average for non-Indigenous people, only 22 per cent for prescribed drugs. Per capita levels of direct Commonwealth expenditure on Indigenous people were 63 per cent of per capita expenditure on all Australians. In other words, while Senator Heron stands up and gives us the good news, he doesn't balance it in what was in his, with what was in his own oration stating clearly that when you roll everything in that the Commonwealth spends on Aboriginal health, all the Aboriginal medical services, uh, all the specific programs designed for rural and remote Aboriginal people, you still don't come up with the same level of spending as is being spent uh, on, uh, on, on average on all uh, other Australians. 
So I say to Senator Heron, just on this one issue, it's, it's something that you should and did, I'm sure you have detailed knowledge of. You are still not standing up for Aboriginal Australians and saying, yes, we know we're still a long way behind. The figures show very clearly we are a long way behind. Yes, the states are spending money on Aboriginal Australians, but th that's the hospital end. That's the acute care end when people are seriously ill. What we should be doing and what we should learn from Canada, New Zealand and other countries is that the money has to go into primary health care. And again, I go back to uh, the comments from the AMA. And basically, uh, the, and I quote again, the current policy of incremental change brings incremental results. In other words, we need a Minister for Aboriginal Affairs who will stand up and say, all the evidence here in Australia, all the evidence overseas is that we must really put some money into primary preventative health care for Aboriginal Australians. Now, I, I just want to finish uh, because I want to leave some time for two of my colleagues, uh, Senator Woodley and Senator Ridgway, um, on this particular issue. And I'm just going to deal with one other matter, and that's the comment Senator Heron's made about all his visits to Aboriginal communities, about what's being achieved there, what their priorities are. And I acknowledge, and I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very positive step for a minister to visit, and indeed a minister of Aboriginal Affairs to visit rural and remote communities. But I've also visited uh, rural communities, Aboriginal communities, and I find a very different picture. I find people who do not believe that they're being adequately represented, people with a range of other prior priorities, and, have, and uh, in places where those communities are a part of a, a larger town, a, a larger settlement, the, the elements now um, in the 1990s of racism, the lack of understanding is absolutely appalling. So the, while the minister talks about the positives, I think when he goes to Aboriginal communities, he needs to step back and really listen to what is actually happening out there on the ground. And I'll just give you one ex uh, example, and that was a visit to uh, Bawarana uh, back in uh, January 1995. I visited that town at a time, I think it was a day after the pastoral board had decided that because a couple of sheep had been attacked, they were going to kill all the Aboriginal people's dogs, simply poison them with 1080 poison. Now they went ahead and, did, ahead and did that. It was including dogs that were on the chains in the Aboriginal community. Uh, I understand, from, or certainly from memory, at least two children uh, had to receive medical attention because of their contact uh, with dogs who'd been vomiting and also with baits. We went to find a very, and I was joined uh, in that visit by a number of people from the AMA. We went uh, to uh, witness a very distressing scene at the local dump because the bodies of the dogs had been taken out there and the children wanted to find their dogs. They had someone on the gate of the dump trying to stop the kids from going in looking for their dogs. We then went out to talk to the local community. It's out to one side of the town to find that that community at that particular point in time was being sprayed by raw sewage uh, that the local farmer was distributing over his paddock and it just happened that the wind was drifting that way and the community was being sprayed uh, with a, a mix of raw sewage. So to say that, um, or to give the impression as Senator Heron has done today that all is well, that everything's going on uh, swimmingly, that uh, if we just tackle this specific problem and that specific problem isn't good enough. We have to listen to the people, we have to listen to their immediate concerns, to the we have to be aware and have some understanding of the enormous pressures many of these communities are still under. I just don't understand how Senator Heron thinks he is consulting and he is listening. We have so many instances where communities are literally coming apart at the scenes. Of course domestic violence is an issue, but there are so many broader problems, so many issues such as the dealing with the stolen generation that go to the very heart of our relationship with Aboriginal people. So I say to the minister, no matter which issue we look at, whether it's mandatory sentencing, whether it's the state native title regimes that are coming through with virtually no word from the minister at all, whether it's specific issues relating to community after community. We need a minister who's going to stand up and be an advocate on behalf of Aboriginal people, who's going to give them the sense that somebody's listening, that a person in charge is actually going to make a difference to their lives, not to see a few dollars going in here and there or another army project and try and convince everybody that all is well. And hopefully, uh, in, the, in the weeks and months to come, 
uh, if this minister is to stay in this portfolio area, we will see a very different change of heart, a change of priorities and a real m move towards actually listening and working with Aboriginal people. <coughs> Senator Bolkus. Ranking Deputy President, I also rise to uh, support this resolution before the Senate. I think in the views, it is the view of many Australians that this minister's actions have failed this nation and for this he should be sacked. It's their view that his actions have failed Indigenous Australians and for this also he should be sacked. And it's their view that this minister's actions have failed the test of competence and for this failure also he should be sacked. At the end of some four years in office, the record of this minister is one of neglect, of incompetence and of national embarrassment. At the end of the last 10 days of his term of office, we find the vital recon reconciliation process shipwrecked or at a dead end, to quote the government's own social justice commissioner, and we find our first Australians suffering a hurt to which they should never have been subjected, a hurt directly emanating from a cynical rejection of their real history, of their suffering, and a hurt directly caused by the government of this country. This minister's portfolio is a sensitive one. He has responsibility for the most dispossessed in our society. The issues facing this portfolio go to the most fundamental of issues facing this nation, its definition. They are issues which affect how the rest of the world sees us, and they are issues which take, dictate whether we are divided or united. In all these responsibilities, the minister has failed, and we should take on board the fact that the damage he has caused will take years, if not decades, to correct. Remember, we still haven't shrugged off, some 20 to 30 years later, the impact on our international image of the white Australia policy. Let's not be naive as to what's been going on here when we approach this resolution. This minister's co-conspirator at all times in his missions has been the Prime Minister, a Prime Minister who lends encouragement to this minister's agenda, a Prime Minister whose tolerance of the voices of racism and hate has long been chronicled, a Prime Minister whose rejection of the validity of the claims of the stolen generation is well known. A Prime Minister who cares not if the rest of the world sees Australia as a country which discriminates racially. And a Prime Minister whose international profile develops daily in the image of Ian Smith and whose image continues to damage how the rest of the world sees Australia. It's a Prime Minister who says saying sorry is a human response but can't find it in his heart to be human to the stolen generations. This is a central motion that in many ways we were always going to have. For the Minister's record in this portfolio has made it inevitable. The Howard Government was hardly sworn in. The ink on the oaths of allegiance was hardly dry when Senator Heron took his first swipe in Indigenous Australians. And right from the start he used that old dog whistle. Its pitch was heard very clearly by those to whom he was really trying to appeal, the Hanson voters. On the 10th of April 1996, the minister confirmed what every Hanson voter wanted to hear. Indigenous grantees of public money were not, and I quote, fit and proper persons. He announced the appointment of a special auditor to, as he might have said at the time, weed them out. And right from the start, he bungled it. The audit was found to be invalid by the federal court, and ultimately the auditor found that over 95 per cent of recipients were cleared for further funding. Most of their mistakes were technical in nature. Now, the establishment of the audit was well publicised by this minister because that's what Hanson voters wanted to hear, but the results were not, for it told those very same voters something their prejudices could not accept. So much for care for this constituency. From then it went ba from bad to worse. 1996 saw some $470 million budget cuts to ATSIC over some four years. Employment, training, youth affairs and housing hardest hit. 1998 saw ATSIC expressing a no-confidence motion in their minister, a view that they held for some 12 months, if not more. 1998 also saw the minister introducing the ATSI Heritage Protection Bill, a bill which turned out to be even beyond the pale for this government, had to be radically reviewed. And 1998 also saw this minister in a full frontal attack on the Kimberley Land Council and then embarrassed because his facts were wrong and a later attack on Australia's Aboriginal leadership a leadership which is rightly respected worldwide, but a leadership vilified at home by this minister and this government. But it's not only non-government members who have been concerned with the minister's competence. 
The big issues in Indigenous affairs for this nation have been social policy, they have been native title and reconciliation. And it is with these issues that the Prime Minister's real assessment of this minister has been made clear. For in giving responsibility for these issues to other ministers, the Prime Minister has said very loudly and unequivocally, this minister is not up to the job, that he is not competent enough to handle the main issues affecting Indigenous Australians, that housing, education, employment, as well as native title and the reconciliation process are better handled by other ministers. That view is something, obviously, with which I concur and the opposition concurs. Nowhere, however, is the cynicism, incompetence and offensiveness of Senator Heron and of this government more evident than the handling of the Stolen Generations report and in the submission the minister produced to the Senate committee just over a week ago. The government was handled, handed this Heriot report in early 1997. In March 1998, one year later, when Sir Ronald Wilson, the uh, chairman of the Herioc at the time, wanted to meet the minister to discuss implementation of the report and monitoring of implementation of what was a very crucial report, the um, minister refused to meet with Sir Ronald Wilson. In fact, the chief of staff of the minister's office wrote to Sir Ronald's office stating, and I quote, there was no reason to meet to discuss that, and I quote, arrangements are already in place to monitor implementation. It was too early to say if the existing process required supplementation and that the ministerial council, and I quote, will, will be providing intergovernmental coordination mechanism as required. Now that's the response that Sir Ronald got. Some 12 months later, in the estimates process, we asked the minister what the state of play was. We asked the minister what measures were in place to ensure the monitoring of the implementation of a response to this national issue. And it's fair to say that the minister had absolutely no idea. Some 12 months later, and the evidence shows this, in the, on the 2nd of June 1999, the evidence of the Estimates Committee shows that the minister couldn't remember whether Sir Ronald's project group requested to meet with him. He couldn't remember whether he had, he had in fact met with Sir Ronald to discuss the preparation of a follow-up report. And the minister also made it very clear that he wasn't involved in the decision as to who would monitor the implementation of the response, whether it would be the Commonwealth or the state. He had no idea and the record shows <coughs> he didn't care that he had no idea. What was even more worrying for those interested in the issue was that Mr Vaughan, Senator Heron's most trusted senior bureaucrat in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, a person whose responsibility, as it appeared in that Senate transcript, was to do the thinking for the minister, also no, had no idea as to some quite critical factors in terms of monitoring and implementation to this Herioc report. Mr Vaughan had no idea as to who actually chaired the monitoring committee, whether the committee had met. He indicated that the Commonwealth expressed no interest in chairing such a vital response committee. He said that the minister was not even consulted as to whether the Commonwealth should chair it and that uh, we, sh we saw from the evidence the minister didn't care to be involved. He told us that ATSIC wasn't consulted and the record also shows that Mr Vaughan and the minister had no idea as to not only who chaired the committee but who composed it. Now, the committee was set up in August 1998. Estimates of which I speak were on the 2nd of June 1999. Some almost 12 months later, some 10 months later, this committee, charged with most critical implementation of a response to the plight of those stolen generations, had not met. Not only had it not met, this federal minister with responsibility for the area didn't know whether it had met and didn't care to know. We further established that even though the monitoring committee hadn't met, there had been no action by the Commonwealth to force a meeting. We discovered that no resources were allocated to the committee and we discovered the Commonwealth didn't know if any person and indeed whether or how many people were involved in preparing the critical response and monitoring it. No interest, no concern, no compassion. His portfolio was in auto drive and the minister didn't even care if it left the parking bay. So it's no little wonder that we got the report that the minister released last week. Some in the gallery say that the government's response wasn't an attempt to play wedge politics because of the fallout since its release. Some in the gallery say that wedge politics are 
more a US tactic and not one that would work in Australia. Now what nonsense, what naivety, what a cop-out. Why is it that also, all, all too often in this country we don't want to face the facts, especially when those facts can be uncomfortable? What sort of excuse is it for this government to say, oh, we couldn't have done it because just look at the, uh, the fallout, look at the, uh, the, in the way that this has panned out. How could we leave it to someone so incompetent to play wedge politics? You know, it's almost like you're hearing Senator Heron say, well, don't hold me guilty for trying to kill someone across the road because all I did was shoot myself in the foot. At law, incompetence is no defence. In this situation, incompetence is no defence. Let's look at some of the relevant facts. This report was released by the Minister's office after days of frustration with the Senate committee which wouldn't release it. This report was cleared by the Prime Minister's office. And despite the Prime Minister's evasiveness about the basic elements of the report saying he hadn't seen it um, before it was uh, leaked to the press, the fact is that the fundamental elements of this report were put to the federal court by the Commonwealth in the Cabillo and Gunner case. There was nothing new to the Prime Minister. All these elements had been cleared by the, PM, by the Department of PMC, by the Prime Minister's personal staff, and this also has been established in the, prime, in the estimates process. The Prime Minister knew what this Minister's position was months earlier, and it's, uh, as I say, quite evasive for him to say that he hadn't seen the report when he knew what was in it. And to those who say, well, this government wouldn't play wedge politics on race, let's remember the number of campaigns in the Northern Territory. Let's remember the federal Adelaide by-election campaign where a candidate there had a spouse of Asian background. Let's remember the 1996 election. And let's remember all the Prime Minister's men, Mr Textor, Mr Morris, Mr Minchin, have all been playing this game for quite some years now. Australia is all the poorer for it. Let's also remember that this is the latest instalment for what it, it, of wedge politics, and let's also remember that it was the Prime Minister and Senator Minchin who, in the middle of the WIC debate, went public on television with dishonest maps of Australia trying to terrorise Australians in a feeling that the Aboriginals were about to take over the huge land mass of this country. What we have, however, in this report is a shabby, selective, offensive rewrite of history. The minister claims, for instance, that stolen generation, the term, doesn't appear in the report. It appears 19 times. He claims on page 30 that children were removed for welfare considerations or where a parent considered, consented, but not otherwise. What a lie. The minister's greatest offence is his attempt to dismiss the practices of the past as being benign. In my speech in moving this for the establishment of the Senate inquiry, I cited extracts from the minutes of the 1937 Conference of Commonwealth and State Aboriginal Authorities. I said uh, of that conference that it met in April 1937 and that the Senate, in considering a resolution that goes to the exercise of Commonwealth responsibilities, should take time to consider some of what was said at that conference. Now, let's go back to that, because these are views, these are motivating views which are quite critical in terms of assessing what was driving policy at the time, but these are views that do not appear in the Minister's uh, submission to the Senate Committee. Professor Cleland, the Chairman of the Advisory Council on Aborigines in South Australia, said, the number of half castes in certain parts of Australia is increasing. This may be the start of a possible problem of the future. A very unfortunate situation would arise if a large half caste population breeding within themselves eventually arose in any of the Australian states. Mr Neville from Western Australia said, in order that the existing state of affairs in WA shall continue, and in order to prevent those half castes who are nearly white from returning to the black, the state parliament has enacted legislation including given control over the marriages of half castes Dr Cook, the Chief Protector of Aborigines in the Northern Territory, took matters even further. He was quite explicit in the fear he wished to share when he said, and I quote, if Aborigines are protected physically and morally, before long there will be in the Northern Territory a black race already numbering about 19,000 and multiplying at a rate far in excess of that of whites. If we leave them alone, they will die. And if we will have, and we will have no problem apart from the pangs of conscience that must attend the passing of a neglected race. If, on the other hand, he said, we protect them, we shall raise another problem which may become a serious one from a national viewpoint. For we shall have in the Northern Territory, and possibly in North Western Australia, 
also a large black population which may drive out the white. He went on to say the white population of the Northern Territory will be absorbed into the black. I suggest that first we decide what our ultimate objective should be and then discuss the means to that end. Now, those were some of the comments. And he stirred some of his colleagues. Mr Harkness from the New South Wales Board of Aboriginal Protection had this to say. He said he was appalled by what Dr Cook had to say in the course of his very lucid speech. I'll go on to quote, it's awful to think that the white race in the Northern Territory is liable to be submerged. There is an historic appeal in preserving a vanishing race, but I think we should seek to assimilate these people. And on it went. These views from the policy planners in 1937 at a critical meeting through and at which the Commonwealth decided to fund the ensuing policy were not reflected in the minister's submission. They were whited out. They were written out. Now, there's, not one, there's no one true recounting of history. What I've tried to capture by going through these statements is the very clear and unequivocal evidence that the fathers of the stolen generation policies and the supporting ideology, ideology and deliberate public deception that followed were not inspired by what Senator Heron calls lofty or misguided motives. They were driven, at least in part, by notions of racial superiority feeding racist fears. And they consciously or unconsciously mirrored the same attitudes that were basically pervading, pervading the world through Nazism. Now, I could go on to quote more and more, and other people have done that. But the point has to be asked, the question has to be asked, why do these statements not appear in the government submission? Well, they don't appear because the government submission essentially is one that attempts to whitewash history. It's selective, it's biased, it's discriminatory, it's a despicable document of denial. Now, it's this inaction, denial and historic revisionism of the Howard government which I think provides the impetus for the resolution that we have before us today. This minister has sneered at the stories, disparaged the reports and punished the victims, punished them by his denial last week in his submission. Is it a blind refusal to accept the validity of these stories in that report or is it a refusal to read the informed research and enlightened works of contemporary historians? What is it that drives this minister? What is it that drives this Prime Minister? Coming back to this minister, his sins are manifold and they need to be repeated. He has been incompetent in the conduct of his responsibilities. He has lacked real interest in the major issues in his portfolio. He has used his constituency for political purposes and he has bungled by ineptness and malintent a most critical area of public policy for reconciliation of this nation. All this at a most sensitive time in our history, at a time when the world's media is knocking on our doorstep to get an insight on this country. Well, we need to start again, and one good way to start again would be to remove this minister. Another good way to start again is to take uh, the attitude and take the advice from one great Australian, someone uh, who may be vilified by this government, but someone who is of international stature, and that's Pat Dodson. His article in the Weekend Age, I think, presented an honest appraisal of the past, where he said this was a place of power through guns and whips. He presented an honest appraisal of the effects of the past. That, and I quote, there's not a single Aboriginal person who hasn't been affected by the consequences of these policies. And he goes on to say it's a ripple effect. And it's not something that just happened in another time in the past. It has an impact right through us today. And he showed quite vividly in that article that these effects currently haunt people's lives. He said, you can see the problems in the children of members of the stolen generation. Parents can't answer their questions. Who am I? Who is my grandmother, my grandfather, my aunt or uncle? Generations of Aboriginal people have lost their identity, their sense of security. They're confused. They have no sense of where they belong. Pat Donson also said, this is about people's lives. It's about families. To debate how many were literally affected at the time is not important. This has touched all of us, and it continues to do so. This is about restoring dignity to people's lives. Now, this minister can't understand that. This can't, minister can't understand that by not having that security, not having that context of belonging, not having that family history, these people will be burdened and handicapped forever. This minister can't understand by saying to them, sorry, you don't exist. That, that aggravates the hurt even more. Unless we understand this, we won't get it right. Unless we get it right as a nation, this nation won't be united in the way it should be. 
We can't do this under this minister. He has to go. Senator Hill. Acting Deputy President, um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to defend um, Senator Heron. Um, uh, rarely have I heard such nonsense as I've just heard from Senator Bolkus talking about the objective of Senator Heron being to punish the, to punish the victims. There are very few, very few ministers that I can recall in the 20 years that I've been in, in parliament who have been more decent, more genuine and more committed to their portfolio responsibilities than Senator Heron. Now, I think uh, anyone uh, fairly looking at the issue of Indigenous affairs, Madam Deputy President, would understand that it is one of the most difficult areas of public policy and public, um, public administration. Uh, and being so difficult, it's often easy that for it to be used for political purposes as is apparently the objective of the Labor Party in this, uh, in this exercise. And I say that because I think it would have come, to a surprise, come as a surprise to some Australians at the weekend to have learnt that on many of these issues, in fact, the Labor Party, sounding so precious, does not even as yet have policy positions, but simply says that if it comes to government, it will then sit down and determine these, uh, these positions. That demonstrates, I think, Madam Deputy President, the opportunism of the Labor Party in this, uh, this instance. Now, it is possible to debate aspects of history, and I listened to Senator Bolkus talking about uh, issues of, of, and attitudes of public policy in 1937. And there's no doubt in my, in my uh, uh, understanding of the history that there were a range of motivations on the part of people who who determined such policy and who implemented such policy, whether on behalf of governments or churches or communities or whatever. Uh, and there's nothing illegitimate in having that, uh, that debate, except that if, it, if there's a contribution to it by the Aboriginal Affairs Minister, then that minister runs the risk of being made a target, as Senator Heron has by the Labor Party for its short-term political gains which I think, Madam Deputy President, is a matter of, um, of some regret. Uh, we've said on this side of the chamber many, on many occasions that we, that we seek to understand the sense of loss of those who, who feel that, they've, that they have in fact lost uh, family, uh, that they've lost culture, that they've lost language. I think we've acknowledged that it would never really be possible for us to fully understand the ramifications of that not having been personally put in the situation. But it's easy to appreciate that, uh, that there are those who feel a great sense of agony and loss as a result of that, uh, that life, uh, life experience. And the debate, the constructive then, debate then in this country, Madam Deputy President, is really about what we as policy makers and policy administrators uh, can do in the future uh, to provide a better opportunity uh, for those who have suffered in this, um, in this way. And we do that to a background where the record of um, our record of, as parliaments and uh, as public administrators in relation to Indigenous people in this country has not uh, been a particularly happy one. Um, we, we inherited the legacy of 13 years of the Australian Labor Party. That, uh, that now lectures us in the way that we hear from Senator Bolkus today. But Senator Bolkus doesn't start his debate by acknowledging that after 13 years of Labor administration, life expectancy for Aboriginal people was 15 to 20 years less than the general population. He doesn't acknowledge that infectious diseases were still 12 times higher than the Australian average. He doesn't acknowledge that Indigenous infant mortality was more than three to five times higher than for other Australian children. He doesn't acknowledge that only 33 per cent of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children completed schooling, compared to a national average of 77 per cent. He doesn't acknowledge that 120 remote Aboriginal communities did not have an adequate water supply system, 134 communities lacked appropriate sewerage systems. 250 communities were without electricity and 176 communities had unsealed roads. 
So despite all the, all the glorious rhetoric of previous uh, Labor ministers over the years, their, their claims and their, their boasts, in so many ways they had failed Indigenous uh, Australians and they'd failed it not only in relation to the, the, the statistics that I just put to you, Madam Deputy President, but uh, by also perpetuating a handout mentality and welfare dependency that many Indigenous people themselves wanted to change. So that was the background to which the Howard government came to office uh, and to which the responsibility, was, uh, the responsibility was given to Senator Heron as minister to lead, to lead in a different direction that can give Aboriginal people uh, better hope for the future. And we make no apologies, uh, Madam President, the Deputy President, that as a government uh, we sought to concentrate on the areas of Indigenous health, housing, employment, education and economic development as areas in which we could do better and provide better outcomes for Indigenous people, provide a framework within which Indigenous people could achieve better outcomes in relation to their own aspirations. We make no apology for that at all. That's the direction that we took which was different from the past and we were prepared to be judged on outcomes in that regard. And we've committed large sums of money uh, in, in terms of helping us implement those programs, programs that have been led uh, by Senator Heron. And uh, I simply make reference again to a record $2.2 billion being spent on Indigenous specific programs during 1999 uh, in the year 2000. Senator Heron, as, a, as minister, has had the responsibility for leading on these programs, for guiding the policy change and for presiding over the public administration. And when I look at the areas such as I've just mentioned, uh, already in a very short period of time, which is worth emphasising, Madam Deputy President, you can, see, you can see changes occurring and changes that will be for the benefit of Indigenous people. In relation to education, expenditure on Indigenous education programs under Senator Heron has increased by $16.3 million in the 1999-2000 year, over $388 million in program funding. We recall the establishment of the National Indigenous English Literacy and Numeracy Strategy launched by the Prime Minister only a few days ago, the 29th of March of this year. Another example of practical reconciliation among all Australians. We recall the establishment of the National Indigenous Students School and also significant improvements in education for Indigenous Australians. Um, I'd just give you the example that in 1990 there was just 1,600 Indigenous Australians attending university. Now there is almost 8,000. So something I would have thought uh, uh, is, is going right, Madam Deputy President, and it's just a matter of regret that, uh, that Senator Bolkus is not prepared to acknowledge it. Looking at the critically important area of education, a new $115 million Indigenous employment program which has an emphasis on private sector opportunities and support for, small, for Indigenous small business. A good, initiative, a good initiative, Madam President, under the leadership of Senator Heron. Major features of the scheme include a strategy to encourage chief executive officers to recruit and train Indigenous staff, private sector structured training and a national cadet, cadetship program for cadetships in the private sector. The sort of practical solution, outcome-based policies that Labor Party wouldn't understand, but which Senator Heron has been prepared to lead upon as a Aboriginal Affairs Minister in trying to find new directions that can achieve better outcomes. An emphasis on apprenticeships and traineeships. I remind you, Madam Deputy President, that when we came to office there were just 800 Indigenous apprentice, apprentices and trainees Australia-wide. Three years later, this number had grown to 4,800. Something is being done right. But does Senator Heron get any credit for it? Certainly not from the Australian Labor Party. Madam Deputy President, I remind you also of efforts in encouraging the unemployed to undertake community work, return for income support through the Community Development Employment Project Scheme, helping them, facilitating their move to mainstream 
employment. So that in the areas in the area of employment, there is hope for the future. Programs have been put in place that can give greater confidence to Aboriginal people that they not, are not necessarily going to have to suffer the disadvantage that they've suffered in that area in the past. In relation to health, where Senator Heron has taken a particular interest, Madam Deputy President, in 1999, year 2000, the government allocated $78.8 million over four years for improved access to primary health care through the Primary Health Care Access Program. By 1999 to 2000, funding of $185.8 million annually will be allocated to Indigenous specific health programs, a real increase of 20 per cent since 1998-99 and a real increase of 51 per cent since March of 1996 when Senator Heron became the minister. By the year 2002 to 2003, it will have increased 62 per cent. Enormous increase in real terms for which Senator Heron, Madam Deputy President, deserves credit. I remind you also of the landmark achievement in August 1997 when a set of 58 national performance indicators and key targets for Indigenous health was agreed by Commonwealth, State and Territory health ministers. Targets included a 20 per cent reduction over 10 years in both the overall death rate and the rate of comparison with uh, non-Indigenous uh, deaths. Madam Deputy President, extra funding provided in the 96-97 budget over three years for establishment of 35 new and expanded Indigenous health services deserves particular mention. Now 36 new services in rural and remote Australia. In March 1997, the government committed $12 million over two years to programs to prevent the spread of HIV AIDS in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. And in the 98-99 in the budget, $12.9 million over four years was announced for a new national Indigenous pneumonia and influenza immunisation program. Practical benefits for Aboriginal people brought about because of the leadership of Senator Heron, who is being attempted who, through this Senate, through the ALP in particular, is attempting to, set, to censure today on his, uh, his uh, ministerial performance. Madam Deputy President, I can move on to the area of housing. In 1999 to 2000, $360 million will be spent on Indigenous specific housing and, and infrastructure programs, comprising $260 million from AT6 Community Housing and Infrastructure Program, $91 million from the Aboriginal Rental Housing Program and $8 million by the Torres Strait Regional Authority. Some might say uh, overdue, Madam Deputy President. That might be the case, but at least under the leadership of Senator Heron, it is now actually being delivered. These programs provide for new housing and infrastructure as well as ongoing management and maintenance of existing housing. They provide over 1,000 new homes annually. And in 1997-98, over 600 housing units were purchased or constructed, over 1,100 renovated, and a number of infrastructure projects, including sewerage, water, power and roads, were funded. And for that, at least, I'm prepared, Madam Deputy President, to congratulate Senator Heron. An extension of the very successful ATSIC Army Community Assistance Program, of course lampooned by the ALP, $41.2 million over four years, fulfilling the government's 98 election commitment in Beyond Welfare. This program provides basic infrastructure to remote communities, including freshwater, sewerage and housing, and provides training for Indigenous people in the provision of such infrastructure and service. Uh, and our defence forces, Madam Deputy President, deserve particular recognition for the contribution that they have made in this regard, which I know has been appreciated by many Indigenous uh, Australians. So, in the area of housing, significant improvements are being made. Still, a lot of work yet to be done, but under the leadership of Senator Heron, on the basis of his record in such a short period of time, one can have confidence that better outcomes will, in fact, be achieved. Madam Deputy President, if I move to the area of law and justice, formulation of a national strategy to combat Indigenous family violence, something, something that the Labor Party turned away from when they were in government because it was in the too hard basket, Madam Deputy President. 
Under the strategy, Indigenous communities will propose locally based responses to be run at community and regional levels. The strategy will lead to the development of support services for victims of family violence, preventative programs for children and young people, as well as treatment programs for offenders. We will also examine ways of better regulating the supply and distribution of alcohol. Extra funding of $25 million in the 1990-2000 budget to partnerships against domestic violence initiatives, bringing total funding to $50 million. Madam Deputy President, Indigenous family violence is a priority area under Senator Heron for new funding. The continuing reform of the Aboriginal legal services. This includes ensuring that Indigenous women have full access to legal representation, an additional $2 million with a further $1 million in the 1999-2000 budget for initiatives which specifically address violence, requiring greater performance reporting and monitoring, regular reviews, contestability and outsourcing in relation to the provision of legal services. Yes, Madam Deputy President, a difficult area for reform, but nevertheless one that had to be tackled and it's been tackled by Senator Heron. The development of measures of relative disadvantage by the Commonwealth Grants Commission to target resources more effectively to the areas of greatest need, $3.2 million in the 1999-2000 budget, also fulfills a 1998 election commitment and delivered under Senator Heron. If I can move, Madam Deputy President, to employment and economic development, something also shunned by the Australian Labor Party. Handout was the, was the, was the formula, not to provide a framework within which Indigenous Australians can, can build for their own economic, uh, economic future. Under Senator Heron, increased funding to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commercial Development Corporation has been possible. This facilitates and promotes joint ventures between industry and the CDC and Indigenous people. Release of the discussion paper, removing the welfare shackles, outlining proposals for a new Indigenous organisation, Indigenous Business Australia, which would promote and participate in joint ventures with the private sector, encourage job creation, act as a conduit in accessing other government assistance and provide housing and business loans, grants and guarantees is another initiative in that regard. So, Madam President, if we look to the future, a future under the the able leadership of, of Senator Heron, we see a government that will continue to address the health, housing, education and employment needs on, of Indigenous Australians. We believe that there must be an equality of opportunity for all Australians. It's a motivation strongly uh, held by Senator Heron. The coalition, as I've indicated, is providing practical and responsible solutions to the urgent problems experienced by many Indigenous Australians, particularly in remote areas. For the future, uh, programs being implemented by Senator Heron will concentrate on greater involvement of Indigenous communities at a local level in setting the priorities and needs of their area, aggressively pursuing improved health and housing outcomes, seeking solutions for the domestic violence problems that plague many communities, and encouraging self-sufficiency and employment through education and business opportunities. In a short period of time, Madam Deputy President, Senator Heron has established a record that deserves credit. He has in place a program that is providing a new direction, but leadership that can give all Australians greater confidence that Indigenous Australians are going to get a fair go, a fair go in the future. Uh, and, he, and he matches that with a plan for the future that demonstrates exactly where he wants to take these programs uh, in the future, as I have just said. His record is one that I am certainly prepared to say that I'm proud of, and I very much regret the negative and carping attack that's been made by the ALP on him today. If the ALP, instead of promoting this new concept of wedge politics, put a bit more effort into a cooperative approach to Indigenous affairs, for the first time would indicate a willingness to work constructively with Senator Heron towards better outcomes than all Australians, but in particular Indigenous Australians, would gain by that. But to expect such approach, a constructive approach from the ALP, 
a, pol a, pa a party which, which fortunately has, unfortunately has demonstrated that through a lack of policies it has no real interest, no genuine interest in this issue other than to try and win a few short-term political points is, I regret to say, too much to expect. But anyway, to that background, the difficulty proposed by a carping negative ALP, I commend Senator Heron for his leadership in this area and for his record to date as a very able and capable minister. Senator Ridgway. Uh, thank you. Um, Madam Deputy President, uh, for the record uh, in the Senate, the Democrats want to say that we treat the censure of uh, a senator as a measure of last resort when all other procedural options have failed. And I have uh, sat here and listened to the comments made by Senator Heron and made by many about why he ought to be commended for various things. I take exception to the fact that Many things are portrayed in the context of how much money is being spent and perhaps that the social decay that exists in Indigenous communities and the moral evil that that presents for the entire nation is one that Indigenous people have to blame for themselves. I think it also renders the whole idea of being able to say sorry or apologise for comments in recent days as being most difficult. And the, and the Australian Democrats have asked numerous questions regarding the Minister's insensitive treatment of the stolen generations. Uh, I felt that it was necessary to move an urgency motion calling on the Minister to acknowledge the existence of the stolen generations. And that motion was successfully moved in the Senate. Yet what we've seen since that day is that the Minister continued to show further insensitivity towards the stolen generations and indeed to all Indigenous people. You cannot give an apology or inspire a particular outcome if that is always qualified. And I think that in defiance of the urgency motion, Minister Heron has in fact done nothing to ease the hurt and the trauma that Indigenous peoples to continue, continue to feel as a consequence of past policies of separation, but more precisely to the comments recently by Senator Heron. I think that many Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians have told me that what he has done is, ex is exactly the opposite, and that is to add insult to existing injury. One message that was sent to me recently by a constituent, but sent to all senators in this place, is relevant to demonstrate the damage that the minister's recent comments in relation to the stolen generations ha is having on all Australians. And she wrote, to my elected representatives, I am finding it increasingly hard to hold up my head with pride and call myself Australian. I migrated here because I loved the freedom and tolerance of this multicultural country. Now I find myself in a country that no longer upholds these ideals, that is no longer a model to the world, but becoming increasingly a pariah state. She went on to say many other things, but the most important point that she made was that the government now refutes the notion of the stolen generation, of the continuing pain felt by members of the stolen generation and the poverty and the health <coughs> and problems of dislocation within Indigenous communities across the country, more so as a result of, of the consequences of past practices of forcibly removing children from their parents and their subsequent mistreatment. And she made the point that this all defies belief that somehow our minister and the government cannot accept what is plain to see. She also went on to say that please consider this shameful behaviour and please work to overturn these, uh, uh, these policies. And I think that it's fairly clear that we all understand the difference between right and wrong. It is a very simple question and it is very plain on its face that we're asking for a simple outcome. And the Australian Democrats have only ever sought to move two censure motions in the recent past, despite what has been said by Senator Heron and others earlier. And I ask that our support for this censure motion be seen in that light, despite the Minister's comments. I also note that the Minister is keeping par with the Australian Democrats on this issue, and that on two occasions the Minister was up against two other censure motions one in 1996, which passed the Senate, but these motions also questioned the minister's ability
to represent Indigenous Australians and were initiated because of the minister's attacks on the peak national organisation delivering services to Indigenous communities, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. Does this sound familiar? And I think that this is not the first time that we're visiting the minister with this type of censure motion. And his ability to represent Indigenous people is again being questioned by the Senate. And again, the minister has sought to blame ATSIC for his own, own failure to implement the recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report. Over the last week, the minister has repeatedly demonstrated that he is not representative of Indigenous Australians or their interests. And it has also become self-evident that the term stolen generations is a mere phrase to the minister. He has been unmoved by the pleas for recognition and basic res res respect that were heard in this chamber on Thursday last week. And when members of the Stolen Generations directly addressed the minister, seeking their identity to be affirmed by this government. And I don't believe that the minister appreciates that the label Stolen Generations is really just a euphemism for the scarring and suffering and the experiences of people that have lived the life perhaps different to many other Australians. But it goes to the heart of understanding that these are people that were forcibly removed, usually at a very young age, from their families and, they, and their country. And what we need to understand most of all is that they lost everything that was familiar and reassuring to them, only to be thrust into utterly foreign surroundings. They were denied the love and the nurturing of families that many of us take for granted and they were denied their culture and their language and identity as Indigenous people. And so, Mr. Uh, uh, Madam, Acting, Madam Deputy President, um, Acting Deputy President, I, I cannot explain what it means to be a member of the Stolen Generations because I'm not a member. But there are many hundreds of personal accounts contained in the Bringing Them Home report, and every single one of them is a poignant story of the human sufferings that was so unnecessary and so damaging. And they are the stories that we need to listen to because it is about untold suffering, it is about lost opportunities for these people, it is about the emotional scarring and trauma, and they provide a window into the depths of, of racism uh, that Indigenous people have suffered over generations after generation in this country. Yet to the minister, he seems to think that these primary accounts from those who were stolen or those who saw their children being taken away failed to demonstrate that entire generations of Indigenous Australians have been affected at all. And they failed to demonstrate that several generations of Indigenous children were stolen to disrupt and ultimately to sever Indigenous cultures and languages and to sever connection with families. Most of them were stolen because of the simple fact that they were either Aboriginal or part Aboriginal. No doubt you would have read on the weekend in the papers that a welfare officer made the point that children were taken even where there wasn't neglect. And until the Bringing Them Home report in 1997, Indigenous people in this country had borne the weight of their suffering in virtual silence. And the term stolen children was virtually unheard of in the community. But the Bringing Them Home report presented, I think, one great thing. It provided a vehicle by which people could tell their stories and it helped to change much of the silence of the past and to promote awareness and to bring about some compassion, not only from the people of Australia but from this government, where there had been ignorance and denial about the forced removal of children. So I believe that there is no greater insult to Indigenous Australians than to suggest that the existence of not just one but many generations of stolen children is factually incorrect. I want to put a few things on the record because one person who has invested a great deal of effort into the research of the Stolen Generations and their personal experiences is Dr Peter Reid from the Australian National Universities. And in response to the Minister's assertions that the term Stolen Generation is a mis misnomer, Dr Reid had the following to say, and I quote, Generations? Yes, generations. Because the first Aboriginal children were brought to the native institution at Parramatta in 1814. They did not come voluntarily. The numbers at the school were so low that in 1816, governor, the governor of the time sent out an expedition 
to capture 12 more children, and they only caught two. And nearly 200 years later, in the 1980s, children of failed mixed marriages were still being placed with the white parent by magistrates who believed that Aboriginal parents were somehow inferior to any other Australian. And that's not one generation, we're talking about eight generations. In New South Wales in the 50s, the figure for child separation was about one in three. In the problem rural towns, it was one in five. And along the Sturt Highway in the Northern Territory from the 1920s to the 1960s, the removal rate was close to 10 out of 10. So in response to the minister's refusal to use the term stolen uh, generation, Dr. Reid made the following comments, and I quote, stolen generations, yes, because more than 1,000 separated children in New South Wales, whom he had personally known and privileged to know and worked with in the, early eight, in the early 80s, not one mother could be said to have given up her child voluntarily. Yes, perhaps there were circumstances when many signed some kind of consent form, but they signed under duress. And to be told by the hospital matron that you're perhaps wicked or selfish or less than and that your baby needs to be given up, that's not a matter of free choice. And to be told that if you sign the paper, we'll only take your eldest child, which happened on many occasions, well, that's not free choice either. And to be told later on that if you don't sign this form, you'll be committed as a delinquent minor and the father of your baby will be charged with carnal knowledge. Well, again, that's not about free choice. In all, the children were taken, signed paper or not. Many of the parents asked to have their children back. I don't know one who had their child returned. And he went on to say many other things. What strikes me as perplexing about this issue, and I'm appalled to say it, is, is that Australia now finds itself in the midst of a national debate about race relations in this country and under the microscope of the United Nations for the way that we treat our Indigenous people. And I find it incredibly disheartening to see Australia unable to make a judgment between what is right and what is wrong and then to act on that convention, uh, conviction. It seems that every time we think that we're about to say something right, we must qualify that in some form. And disappointingly but predictable, the government's primary defence to the Australian community is the very tired justification of the amount of government spending on Indigenous communities across the country. I have to say one thing, Madam Acting Deputy President, and that is that that is prostituting figures for the very worst purposes, and I think Australians are increasingly suspicious and fed up when they hear that the government suggests that everything is all right because money is being spent. Well, so what? It really comes back to making the rhetoric match the action. And so far, the minister's actions have failed. And so too with this magical figure of $2 billion. And when you look closely at that figure, it really comes down to understanding that it is about meeting specific Indigenous programs that are substitute for others and trying to bridge the gap where other programs uh, are not provided. And Indigenous programs, not like others, are comparatively expensive. And you must take into account the fact that many people live in rural and remote communities. I think that there also needs to be mentioned the fact that these comments were unnecessary. The government continues to say that its response in its submission to this Senate inquiry has been a factual one in response to the Bringing Them Home report. And that might be right on all accounts, but on one. The Bringing Them Home report never mentioned the stolen generations. There was no reason for the submission to deliberately mention the stolen generations and somehow provoke a fight with Indigenous people and the nation about what was right and wrong and what was decent behaviour. And this unnecessary reopening of the wounds of the stolen generations and the suggestion by the minister that somehow semantics rules out their right to refer themselves as stolen generations is simply not acceptable behaviour for the federal representative of Indigenous people in this country. The stolen generations, let alone anyone else, should not be forced to once again relive their experiences in an effort to justify themselves 
in an effort to justify their identity to the minister who supposedly represents them. Madam Acting Deputy President, I would like to remind the minister of a letter that I believe he received last week from Dr Archie Barton. Dr Archie Barton was a foundation member of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation and himself a member of the Stolen Generations, but also someone who has been recognised for his contribution to national life by the award of an Order of Australia Medal. And his words summed up the message that I think most Indigenous Australians would like to hear the minister say and to act on. As the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, this is the minim minimum that Indigenous Australians should expect from their government representative. Anything less is just not good enough. And Dr Barton made the following comments. Any attempt to quibble with the term stolen generation diminishes your government not those who were taken from their parents against their will. There is no doubt that some officials who took Aboriginal children from their families genuinely believed that they were acting in their best interests. However, time and the bringing them home report has not demonstrated that forcefully that this was not the case. And clearly the important thing is for your government to show courage and leadership and have the decency to admit on behalf of previous Australian governments that these policies were wrong and caused much damage. Until your government does so and finds constructive ways to address the enormous grief and harm caused by previous governments, this issue will continue to fester. I have previously indicated to the Prime Minister, Mr Howard, that this is an issue on which Aboriginal people expect resolute and courageous leadership. And this means then that he must have the courage and generosity of spirit to admit that he has been wrong so far and to make an unqualified apology on behalf of the Australian government. In my view, the most important thing you could do for those many generations of Aboriginal people since colonisation who saw many of their children stolen would be to induce your Prime Minister to show that leadership and thus commence the healing process. I would have to say that this really comes down to a question of the authority being exercised by the minister, Senator John Heron. And it seems to me in the attempts to manipulate information to suit a particular outcome that this is about authority abused. And authority abused of that sort does justify contempt and it does incite behaviour from people that condemns the minister's comments. It's not good enough to continue to say to the nation that the moral evil within Indigenous communities is the blame of Aboriginal people themselves. This is absolute abuse and manipulation of authority of a minister of this government. And it would be far simpler to acknowledge the stolen generations, but it must be done without saying one thing and thinking another. This is just giving injury to hurt, and this is what's happened in the past few days. And how can a minister or a government acknowledge the past and then somehow seek to acquit history? And how can the minister try to acquit himself of recent comments? He can't qualify what has been said. And such comments do leave us open to further scrutiny, and it leaves, I believe, an indelible stain on national character as this nation undergoes further examination, not just by the conscience of all Australians, but by the United Nations. And I've always viewed that much of the strength of any government relies upon good people within government. And it seems to me that this minister has failed his responsibilities. On three occasions, he has been censured as the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs for having failed Indigenous people and for having failed in his position. It is his responsibility to represent the interests of Indigenous people with the government of the day. Much of what needs to be said about this is that the minister has acted irresponsibly. He has acted irresponsibly as the minister that is representative of Indigenous Australians. And it seems to me that, perhaps not too soon, it might be time for the minister to consider bringing forward his retirement. Because, quite frankly, Indigenous Australians need someone that will represent them, not someone that will uh, reprimand them 
for having to stand up for rights that are just and for rights about overcoming disadvantage without feeling blame and without feeling that they are told to be the victims of their own circumstances. Senator Brown. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. A great pity the minister wasn't here to hear Senator Ridgway's uh, contribution. When I look at this matter, I um, am, am troubled not just from the Indigenous point of view, but by the, uh, the apparent reality that the minister believes in what he's doing and believes that it is the right course of action and moreover believes that it's come as a result of his consultations with the Indigenous people of this country. Uh, while I don't see that as a neurosis or um, um, behaviour of that sort, there is, there is certainly sublimation involved in that, an inability to look at the reality that's uh, in front of the minister. When he says to, me, it says to the chamber that the Indigenous people that he's spoken to don't want handouts and welfare, they want power and a measure of control over their laws, I say, well, who would not say that? Who wouldn't? And what does he mean by a measure of control over their lives, rather? And I asked the minister how he would feel if he was represented by somebody who said to you, you can have a measure of control over your life. That's way short of the mark, you see. But that's what the minister said. He believes that Indigenous people should have a certain amount of say in what they do and where they come, uh, how they come and go. But on top of that needs to be this paternalistic interference in their rights. And what I have to say to the minister is it's not until you recognise Indigenous people as uh, firstly equal and secondly the first Australians, which is beyond equality, that you'll uh, understand that your words are way short of the mark. Indeed, uh, that comment about the most pressing issue in Indigenous affairs these days is family violence was a come on to say, who's going to challenge that? Well, I do. The most pressing issue in Indigenous affairs these days is empowerment, return of pride, return of culture, return of land, the things which uh, will mean that uh, Indigenous people again uh, uh, return their day in the sun. And when you get that, you'll, you'll uh, start to see a turnaround of the internalisation of violence and despair and indeed jailings, which is coming out of this government's policies, which is a failure to understand that you have to get, you have to meet uh, our historic challenge to return real power, real rights, real control over affairs to the first Australians if we're going to deal uh, or see an amelioration, a rectification of the uh, um, at times harrowing outcomes of policies which fall short of that mark. Finally, uh, I measure the minister by um, the words of South Australian Governor, Ho Governor Hindmarsh, who, uh, according to the book With the White People by Henry Reynolds, With the White People, uh, was addressing the clans of Indigenous people around Adelaide 150 years ago. And here's what uh, Governor Hindmarsh had to say. Black men we wish to make you happy, but you cannot be happy unless you imitate white men. Build huts, wear clothes, work and be useful. Above all things, you cannot be happy unless you love God, who made heaven and earth and men and all things. Love white men, love other tribes of black men, learn to speak English. They could come from the words of this minister in the year 2000, uh, from the mouth of this minister in the year 2000. In fact, I would ask the minister, is there any word or phrase or sentence in uh, that invocation from Governor Hindmarsh with which he would not concur. And written into that exercise is why this minister is failing. He hasn't come to the recognition that uh, Australians as a general, in general have come to that we need to change attitudes of 150 years ago. Senator Woodley. Thank you. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, the policies which saw Indigenous children taken from their parents in past generations were wrong. I want primarily to address, to address two issues tonight, and they are that the policies of the past were wrong 
And the question is, has this government really changed direction and repudiated those policies, or does it continue them? The second point that I want to address is to address the way in which those policies have fed the prejudice and racism in the general Australian population in the past and still do. What needs to be made very clear is that the majority of children who were taken from their parents were not taken because they were being mistreated or neglected, but as a direct consequence of the assimilationist policies of governments of the time. While the details of these policies differed between each of the states and territories to some extent, the assimilation of Indigenous children was the aim in all Australian jurisdictions. As the Bringing Them Home report notes from the very beginning, government and missionaries targeted Indigenous children for removal from their families. Their motives were to inculcate European values and work habits in children. Government officials theorised that by forcibly removing Indigenous children from their families and sending them away from their communities to work for non-Indigenous people, this mixed descent population would over time merge with the non-Indigenous population. This was not a benign policy. And it, it, it was not only that the damage was done by this policy to Aboriginal families, but it was a policy which fed racist attitudes in the years before World War II and ever since. One of the stolen children, in her own research, came across some resolutions of the Metropolitan Branch Women's Section of the United Country Party, dated August 1934. I want to read into the record some of those resolutions to show you the attitude that people had to this very policy. The fact that there were those uh, white political parties who themselves objected to the policy, not because, not because they had any concern for the Aboriginal people who were affected, but because they had concern for themselves. This is what the resolutions read, and I'll only read some of them. That statements in the press have noted to the effect that the federal government is bringing to Melbourne from the Northern Territory a number of Octoroon girls with the avowed object of mingling them in marriage with the white community. That further, it is stated that these girls will be secretly domiciled in Melbourne in order to preclude any knowledge of their ancestry being disclosed. That it is greatly to be deplored that the federal government is so far lost to the knowledge of our deep-rooted sentiments and pride of race as to attempt to infuse a strain of Aboriginal blood into our coming generations. And then finally, that the women's organisations of Australia be urged that for the race heritage that is held in trust for the generations to come, for the sanctity of our age-old traditions and the protection of our growing boys, to combat with all their power this insidious attempt to mingle with the community women of illegitimate birth tainted with Aboriginal blood, etc. And it, I, I've stopped there because it gets worse, not better. Now, that was a resolution of a political party in 1934. It was referred to uh, one of the members uh, for Melbourne, and he referred it on to the Minister for the Interior as a serious resolution. Now, I don't know what the Minister for Interior replied because I haven't got the record uh, any further than, um, than what I've told you. But these policies designed towards assimilating Indigenous Australians were not confined to removing children from their parents. Other policies played a part as well. These include removing people from their land, putting them on welfare and resettling them in communities which reinforce their dependency. Senator Heron made a lot of uh, um, reference and a lot out of that whole issue. Well, let me tell him. It was the policies of governments uh, in the past which created the problems that he was so careful to detail for us this afternoon. 
the use of indigenous languages was discouraged and the practice of cultural activities was prevented and thereby the pres preservation of culture became impossible. What needs to be stressed and recognised by all Australians is that indigenous children who are removed from their parents uh, were who, because they were mistreated were in the minority. Likewise, it is important to acknowledge that while some indigenous children taken from their parents under previous policies may believe they were better off as a result, such as we saw in the Sunday program this week, these too are the exception rather than the rule. Past policies were at fault, and I note the uh, minister's reference to the churches uh, in one of the answers he gave last week. Well, sure, the churches were involved in this policy, but let me say to the minister, it was 20 or 30 years ago that they abandoned these policies. What I want to know is whether or not uh, this present government has abandoned those policies. It, there, yes, I did. I just made reference to it. You're a bit late coming in, Senator uh, McGoran. In the early 1970s, the Methodist Church produced a document called Free to Decide, which showed that the self de that self-determination was really the way to go and that past policies had created many of the problems that Senator Heron detailed here this afternoon. And I could go on. Let me recognise Dr John Brown and the Reverend Jim Sweet of the uh, Presbyterian Church. It was in the 1970s that uh, the policy which they initiated to return people to homelands was opposed so vehemently by the Bjelke peterson government. I'm amazed that uh, this government has been unable to recognise uh, what those policies have created or to recognise the link between those policies and what uh, Senator Heron was telling us about domestic violence. I mean, I was, I was really offended by his reference to the fact that the Democrats did nothing. I don't know who he's referring to, but let this Democrat say that it has been almost 40 years of involvement that I've had, along with my wife, in these very issues. And for 40 years we've been battling uh, to try and enable Aboriginal people to have the kind of self-empowerment which would make the difference for them. In 1962, in Mitchell, my first contact with the Aboriginal community there uh, turned my life around. In another answer last week, Senator Heron referred to the actions of the Catholic Church. And uh, he spoke there of the uh, Catholic Church having made a statement of repentance. And uh, he had a go at Senator Faulkner and said, well, perhaps Senator Faulkner doesn't understand what repentance is. I've got a feeling he does. Uh, but let me put on the record what repentance means. It means saying sorry and asking forgiveness. It means making restitution. It means changing direction because the way you've been going is wrong. I would suggest if Senator Heron wants to substitute I repent instead of saying sorry, I'd welcome that. And I'd suggest that he's the one who needs to do the repenting. Senator Faulkner. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I was expecting Har Senator Harradine to speak, who, so uh, a Thanks. slight uh, interregnum here, <laughs> but uh, I think before I reply, if I could just cede the call to Senator Harradine, who made a very impressive and quick entrance, I thought, then, Madam Acting Deputy President. I call Senator Harradine. I, Senator I, Harradine. I thank the Senate, and <clears throat> I'll reciprocate by being brief. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, I wish to enter the debate um, on this very, very serious matter indeed. Um, I don't think we should take lightly uh, any motion that uh, uh, seeks to censure uh, a minister. <coughs> and I certainly don't uh, take this lightly, and from what I gather around the chamber, uh, others haven't taken this matter lightly. Um, Per perception is a very, very important part of public policy. One could um, pass this off, this whole debate off, as a complete foul up. And in a way, it has been a foul up. But it has hurt a lot of people. To 
<coughs> effective <coughs> to deny, uh, not effectively, but to deny uh, the word, the, that there was a Stalin generation, uh, <coughs> as um, was the case uh, in the um, submission by the government, uh, not by the, by the way, prepared in the minister's office, submission by the government to one of our Senate committees, um, is a, um, a, a serious matter. As Senator Aidan Ridgway said, <coughs> it wasn't referred, the taking away of uh, children uh, from their parents was not referred to at the time, of course, as the stolen generation. It, um, it uh, was an action uh, that uh, uh, caused uh, a lot of trauma, heartache, suffering. But when the submission was made public and there was a denial that there was a <coughs> stolen generation, this sparked a justified response which involved the outpouring <coughs> of the hurt and the trauma felt by those parents, uh, I'm sorry, by the children uh, who were actually taken away from their parents. And those children realised that they were being stolen. They knew inherently, within, deep within themselves, uh, that uh, their mother and or, or father were the ones uh, who were there to care for them and uh, they, <clears throat> under those circumstances they should not be taken away from them. As we know, much of this uh, was uh, occurred in Northern Territory and uh, Western Australia. And as we know, uh, some of the policy makers at that particular time um, <coughs> had uh, racist, quite overtly racist reasons for acting as they did. And so we had a, a tremendous outpouring of recent uh, times um, over this particular er er era. And it came on top of the whole man mandatory sentencing um, uh, debate. And I personally am very concerned that this issue be resolved as quickly as possible. I felt that if the amendments that I moved to the legislation were adopted, isolating matter at this particular time of the Northern Territory uh, and the use of the Territory powers to do that, it would not only uh, have um, uh, covered uh, those persons who weren't covered by the bill, namely the 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds and 20-year-olds, uh, whom I am I'm informed uh, were uh, very much uh, vulnerable to the mandatory sentencing policies of the Northern Territory, but it would also have been effective. Nobody can argue with the Commonwealth uh, Parliament's power on, on um, uh, Aboriginal affairs. The, uh, uh, so that matter needs to resolve uh, uh, th that matter certainly needs to be resolved. But I also believe that uh, the government should apologise, should apologise uh, and um, express sorrow for uh, the uh, practices of, um, uh, of those who took the uh, young uh, Aboriginal children away from their parents. As a matter of course, I've, indeed uh, I'm not 
referring necessarily to those who were in danger. But as we know, as a matter of course, most of these children were not in danger. And uh, therefore there was no, absolutely no uh, right for the state to interfere in the rights of parents. No matter what um, uh, colour the parent's skin was. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, we've heard uh, from the um, uh, Minister his expression of sorrow. And I've listened very carefully to what the Minister has said about this matter uh, since it blew up uh, a week or two ago. <clears throat> And I believe that he, he has uh, been expressing sorrow uh, for, uh, to those who, who have been affected. Now, I wonder whether future governments, and I hope they will, um, express sorrow for what is occurring at the present moment. The stolen generations uh, that are being taken at the moment. And I refer uh, to um, uh, those uh, youth who uh, are so despondent as to be committing suicides. And in uh, Queensland, uh, I refer to the um, uh, Queensland, um, uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women's Task for Force on Violence report, which shows. Um, the dreadful uh, number of uh, suicides that are taking place uh, in Aboriginal, amongst the Aboriginal population of Queensland. I think that, um, um, and, I'll, and I'll just quote from the report, in Queensland a recent study of suicides over six uh, years from <coughs> 1990 to 1995 show Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander males aged 15 to 24 had an extremely high suicide rate, 112.5 per 100,000, uh, compared with 30.8 per 100,000 uh, for Queensland youth generally. And you go further in this report, and I can confirm this anyhow because I know that the concerns uh, that are expressed by Aboriginal mothers is the effect uh, uh, that um, modern culture, if you like, is having on the family and particularly on the young people. And that uh, culture of uh, uh, absolute independence that I know no owe nothing to anybody, not even my uh, existence. And um, the sort of attitude of materialism and acquisitiveness uh, that is um, developing amongst uh, Aboriginal young people. Of course, not only um, an Aboriginal young people, but young people generally throughout Australia. These are matters which we should take into account. And if I can just refer <coughs> to um, the exploitation that takes place in Aboriginal communities uh, by uh, those uh, who supply them uh, with, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, with uh, grog and with, um, um, and with um, um, drugs and, uh, and uh, of course with uh, um, uh, videos. Uh, could I just read from page uh, 100 of the report? Sexual abuse is, is an in inadequate term for the incidence of horrific sexual offences committed against young boys and girls in a number of community locations in Queensland over the last few years. Sexual violence offences are increasing and may be related to negative male socialisation associated with the misuse of alcohol and other substances 
Informants uh, thought the accessibility of pornographic videos in some communities was associated with some violent crime. COD orders of 4,000 to 5,000 worth of videos reportedly coming into the Cape communities, and so on and so forth. One community with a history of pornographic video usage coincidentally has the highest rates of men in prison for sexual offences in Queensland. Factors such as family breakdowns, child protection needs, juvenile offending patterns, early school dropout, youth suicide and misuse of alcohol and other substances were all linked to violence by informants. Yes, are we responsible for a current stolen generation? Mrs. Madam Acting Deputy President, I, uh, I believe the time has come for a recommit, putting aside accusing one or the other, and let's be united with a recommittal to, to the course of reconciliation, and let us also have the courage uh, to express our deep sorrow for what has happened in the past. Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Can I commence my uh, contribution in reply by uh, thanking uh, the Australian Democrats uh, and Senator Brown for their joint sponsorship of uh, this motion of censure in the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, Senator Heron. And I do believe that the need to censure Senator Heron has been clear since the publication of his submission to the Senate Legislation uh, Committee inquiry into the stolen generation. He, as a failed minister, should be brought to account. Senator Heron, as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, has been involved in a long-term strategy of driving a wedge of racism uh, through the community. His government was caught out attempting to smother the United Nations report on mandatory sentencing that was requested by the opposition leader, Mr Beasley. And now uh, Senator Heron's own division within the department of Prime Minister and Cabinet has been caught out corrupting the reconciliation polling process. Madam Acting Deputy President, only today, in question time, the Minister, Senator Heron, had no answer to the fact that the bureaucrat in charge of the Office of Indigenous Policy was demanding to insert his own questions on quote, special rights for Aborigines into the phone poll questionnaire carried out by news poll for the National Council for Reconciliation. Uh, let me make this clear. This, of course, has occurred in Senator Heron's own division of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, I lodged a freedom of information application on the uh, news poll uh, that was conducted for the Reconciliation Council and turned up a grubby thread through the paper trail, which led to the question on special rights for Aborigines being included in the polling. The first Assistant Secretary of the Office of Indigenous Policy and the Prime Minister's own office knew full well that the public is susceptible to questions on special rights, whether treaties or compensation, or in this case um, his demand for a gratuitous question for, uh, on special seats uh, for Aborigines in Parliament. An issue that hasn't really featured in the whole of the reconciliation debate. It's the old Mark Texter trick, a technique imported from the Northern Territory and the CLP in the Northern Territory. 
it's divisive, and frankly, it borders on push polling. Madam Acting Deputy President, people who have been uh, giving John Howard, the Prime Minister, the benefit of the doubt on whether he's embarked on um, a second term of, um, of, uh, of racist-type wedged, wedged politics, I don't think can doubt any longer. Newspoll knows how divisive these issues are. That's why their report is careful to note that, uh, and I quote them, the special rights for Aborigines question was included at, quote, the client's request. They were obviously embarrassed. But it was more than a request. It was a demand. One draft questionnaire has the handwritten note on it. The question on special rights must, capital M, capital U, capital S, capital T, must go in. In the end, the Prime Minister's office got its own way uh, to, uh, to the protest of the unit, which serves the Reconciliation Council. The question on special rights was inserted into the quantitative polling, uh, and it was asked of 1,300 Australians. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, a dirty great wedge has been driven into the results. Well, I've got to say, if Senator Heron was a minister worth his salt, he'd have put the kiwash on that polling and he would have reprimanded the, uh, those involved, the bureaucrat involved, but of course he didn't. Uh, he was in on the fix and I think on that matter alone the, Her the, the Senate is, uh, is correct to censure Senator Heron. But I think uh, senators uh, who would have listened carefully to the uh, government's defence of this cen censure motion would have heard uh, from Senator Heron and Senator Hill uh, a lengthy recitation of the government's programs in the area of Indigenous affairs and expenditure under each of these programs. Uh, I heard a lot of reference to the term practical reconciliation, uh, a term I, I've no doubt we'll hear a, much more about in the coming weeks as the government draws further and further away from the reconciliation proposals of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. To my mind, practical reconciliation is a rhetorical term, uh, simply code for delivering to Aboriginal Australians the support and assistance to which they are entitled to as Australian citizens. It's core business for any government. And if reconciliation is to become a reality, much more than practical reconciliation will be needed. Sensitivity will be needed. The views of Indigenous leaders will have to be heard, they'll have to be taken on board. Leadership will re be required on issues that are of concern to the Indigenous community. Leadership will be required to ensure that government programs actually deliver benefits on the ground to Aboriginal people. And all of these ingredients are lacking under Ser Senator Heron's administration of his ministerial responsibilities. He's displayed gross insensitivity on the most painful and sensitive issue for the Aboriginal people, that of the stolen generations. He's questioned formally on behalf of the government the very existence of a stolen generation. He's ignored the views of Indigenous leaders. Uh, the, the government doesn't want to hear the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliations, prescriptions for reconciliations. It wants nothing of a deadline. It wants nothing of an apology. All too hard for the government, all too hard for Senator Heron. And what do we hear from Senator Heron on the issues of concern to the Indigenous community? On mandatory sentencing, for example, silence. On an apology from the Prime Minister on behalf of the nation, nothing but, uh, in fact, uh, uh, being an apologist for John Howard's refusal to even contemplate this uh, vital and necessary step, uh, I don't really think he understands the significance of an apology to the Aboriginal people. I don't think he gets it. And uh, as to driving Indigenous programs, well, the facts speak for themselves. This minister 
has been asleep at the wheel. And as I've indicated in, uh, in my earlier uh, speech uh, on this censure motion, he's only managed to spend $13 million of the $63 million which was allocated to programs to support the government's uh, response to the Stolen Generations report back in December 1997. On every criterion, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Senator Heron, has been an abject failure, an abject failure. He deserves to be censured, and I would commend this censure motion to the Senate. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Faulkner be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Uh, the ayes have it. Division required? Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition, Senator Faulkner, on behalf of himself and the Leader of the Democrats and Senator Brown be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Quirk, teller for the ayes, and Senator McGoran, teller for the noes. Order. There being 34 ayes and 31 noes, the motion is resolved in the affirmative. It being after 6.30 p.m., the sitting of the Senate is suspended until 7.30 p.m. Thanks, John.